um, we are just going to give a few more minutes uh, for some colleagues to join. They are still trickling in. I will get started soon. So get settled and then we're going to start. We're gonna, we'll be using also the chat to also for those who do not have the, um, you know, the lineup, for instance, uh, handy. You can also check there who might be speaking, what we have in store. So colleagues, we post the, the concept note that you have already received, but also the, the flyer so that you can see what is in store. We're going to get back to you in a few seconds to get started. Okay, uh, five past uh, the hour, uh, I would like to take this opportunity again to welcome you all uh, to this uh, preparatory uh, discussion topic uh, for the, uh, um, the ninth session of um, uh, the AfriCities, a very important gathering in Africa focusing on local and regional government issues. Uh, as you you know, this is one of the premier uh, opportunities uh, to discuss issues of great importance to um, African development. Uh, this year, edition that will take place in Kisumu from the 17th to the 21st May 2022, uh, will focus very much on the role of intermediary cities. So it's not by accident that is taking place in what you may uh, in Kisumu uh, with the the focus on the linkage uh, between urban and rural, uh, really looking at how that uh, the territorial approach can foster better development, can how uh, intermediary cities can leverage uh, their position to uh, accelerate their development. So this webinar uh, had been jointly organized by UCLG uh, Africa and UN Habitat to 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 come up with uh, not necessarily common positions, but uh, drawing from experiences that one of the panel, one of the panel's uh, discussions will focus on that, but also looking at different instrument tools that are out there uh, based on experiences from different countries to actually make that happen. So I welcome you all uh, to this uh, important event. Uh, as you have seen, we have different segments uh, in this uh, discussion. We're going to hear from UN Habitat and UCLG uh, as well on the during the opening that the first leg of the discussion of the uh, during this webinar. Then we're going to hear some really key messages or key takeaways or speeches from uh, some of uh, the speakers. And then we will uh, now have two important panels. Uh, the first one looking at country experiences very much. Uh, the second panel will, look at, will be looking at what uh, some of these uh, institutions that have been working on this issue have come up in terms of instrument tools, methodology to foster this uh, approach. Uh, and then there will be opportunity to discuss all these issues that uh, will have been, uh, you know, air from the opening to the panel discussion um, toward the end. But I would uh, encourage you and my colleagues will also be there in the chat uh, to uh, support you to provide. So be active in the chat. Uh, so it's be live, but also uh, on the site. Uh, be, feel that you are part of it, uh, of the discussion, uh, so that we can harness all this knowledge, all this uh, the wealth of uh, experiences and uh, skills that we have here to make the AfriCities, the ninth edition, a success because of the great preparation that had gone into it. So I thank you all for coming. And now it's my honor and privilege uh, to uh, maybe uh, invite, uh, just a second. I would like to invite um, the director of the regional office for Africa, uh, Mr. Uma Sila, to give us his take of why this is important and what is UN Habitat the position on this part, important topic. 
So, Mr. Umar Sula, if uh, in five minutes you can give us your thoughts, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Remy. Can you hear me? We can hear you well. Go ahead, sir. So, first of all, let me uh, wish a great morning or afternoon to all colleagues, partners, uh, and friends who joined this uh, very important uh, you know, webinar, as you already highlighted, uh, uh, which is a prelude really to this uh, big summit of Africa cities coming in May uh, in Kisumu. But also, we should emphasize you know, the importance of this topic, which is the role of intermediate cities in strengthening urban rural linkages, I mean, rapid urbanization in Africa. So we are very honored as UN Habitat to co-organize this event with UCLG Africa. And we'd like to thank the whole team of UCLG Africa, including Jean Elongbasi for his leadership in advancing the local government agenda in Africa. So this is part of the technical preparatory cycle, of course, for the upcoming nine Africa City Summit to be held in Kisumu in May. But also, as you mentioned, Remy, this webinar will bring to light the very important role of intermediate cities in territorial development and recommendation for policy uh, to local and global contexts. Uh, well, first of all, something we cannot uh, ignore is the rapid trend of urbanization, which has been mo one of the most pressing challenges facing the global communities, including Africa in the 21st centuries. This trend affect all levels of urban centers that range from mega cities to intermediate cities, but also they often result in new priorities as inadequate housing, pressure and infrastructure and public services, environmental degradation due to urban sprawl, among others, increased food security demand, increased economic vibrancy and innovation in all sectors. In Africa, as we know it, and pro-intermediary cities policy option should be considered to ensure that the challenges are addresses and opportunities enhanced in the urban rural continent. In urbanization in Africa has been characterized by less than cities in comparison to other regions, while small and intermediary cities grow faster than the largest cities. There is evidence, for example, in West African countries the region with high rapid urbanization trend in Africa, 60% of the urban populations live in secondary cities, which are often near large cities and along transport corridor. And also only 40% live in the metropolitan area. Uh, in the Africa largest, you know, 57% of urban population who live in cities with less than half of a million inhabitants. Despite the number of urban population in African cities, secondary cities, there are still most of the times gaps in access to services, jobs, opportunity and mobility that are reducing and limiting the possible key role, key role that an intermediary African cities may play in the urban rural continuum. So as we know it, UN Habitat work in Africa, including supporting nine countries toward mainstream urban rural linkages in their national subnational policies. Those countries are Cameroon, Guinea, Tanzania, specifically in Zanzibar, Nigeria in the Niger State, Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, Senegal, Burkina Faso, and Mozambique. And also in the context of COVID-19, UN Habitat in collaboration with University of Nairobi and other academic institutions are assessing the impact of COVID-19 in the flow of people and commodities in the urban rural, link rural linkages context in five countries that are Kenya, Zimbabwe, Senegal, Cameroon, and Niger State in Nigeria. But also the research is being conducted in the context of the major cities, intermediate cities, and a rural area. Also include the regional plan for Grand Conakry uh, in Guinea, which is ongoing, and the special development framework for Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, but also UN Habitat supporting the development of 10 regional plan in Ethiopia, uh, Rwanda, Darfur, among others. Those plans need to be supported by policy oriented to polycentric urban development, able to create the legal and financial means for the implementation. As I conclude, we should acknowledge that the development gaps between urban and rural areas in the midst of rapid urbanization in Africa should be addressed. Fostering the intermediary cities is inevitable in this effort. Intermediate cities are significant in structuring the urban network and connecting the local and regional to the continental and global level. 
This necessitates, of course, the urgent need for urban and sectorial policies to reflect the growing importance of intermediate cities in programming and planning decision. I believe that the ninth session of AfriCity will be a great opportunity to reflect on those opportunities offered by the rapid trend of urbanization in Africa in achieving the new urban agenda, the sustainable development goal, and the African transformative vision of 2063. Again, I would like to thank UCLG Africa for the great collaboration in elevating the role of local government in achieving sustainable development in Africa. Thank you so much, and I wish a successful session. Back to you, Remy. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Papa Uma, for this very important uh, you know, highlight of the, the, the need for policy coherence, the, the, the need of uh, seeing intermediary cities as the connector, and uh, the need of um, uh, the role of urban linkages in the context of urbanization. And this fits very well with what uh, Africa Cities uh, 2021 is trying to achieve to bring all the agenda together from the, the 2030 agenda, the new urban agenda, and the Africa Union 2063 agenda, which is fantastic. So now it's my honor to, to uh, invite uh, Mr. Jean Pierre Elombasi of UCLG Africa to give us his thoughts or take away or key message or things that you can reflect on uh, in this webinar and what we can take forward in the Africa Cities uh, in May 2022. Over to you, Mr. Elambasi. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. And uh, let me for uh, at this uh, beginning of the year to wish all of you uh, a happy new year and to wish all of you good health because this is the challenge of the moment. Um, let me be very brief. I will focus on three main issues. The number one issue is lesson learned from COVID-19. Remember, uh, we were overconfident on the role of the world market to provide uh, goods and services that are needed everywhere, in any places, on our, in our countries and, and continent. And the lockdown that we all witness has proven that this overconfidence on the world market was wrong. And we, we have now the challenge of reverting this trend by relocalizing the production near the consumers, in particular for food systems. And over, uh, uh, over uh, uh, basic uh, requirements of the population. So this uh, uh, change into the way I think it's frozen at my end, I'm not sure. Mr. Elon Basi, can you hear me? Uh, I think we have lost you for a few minutes. I think he already warned us he may face some you know, connectivity challenges and I think it's happening. Maybe let's give him a few seconds to resume. This is the beauty of uh, of the internet. I'm sorry for that, uh, but I warned you before that we were uh, we would be cut off from time to time. I hope you will understand. So I'm back, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, bear with me. I, I will I will try and shorten what I wanted to say. Uh, so this is my first point. We need we have a challenge of bifurcating from the model that were overconfident to the market to a model that relocalized 
the production mm -hmm. <sighs> near the consumers. So it is important that uh, we start this verification at the level where we can master it. And uh, for us, is the intermediary cities because they create the link between cities and rural areas. And uh, the food system is dependent mainly on rural areas and on these linkages. And the structuring of uh, uh, the, the settlements, uh, the sustainable structuring of the settlement of people in a country should rely on this link between rural and urban through intermediary cities. That's my number, number one. The second one is the alert that we got from the IPCC saying that anyway, global warming is here to stay. Even if we made any effort to curve uh, the, uh, the, the global warming. So adaptation to climate change is something that we have to envisage and vision now. And most of the time, uh, we will be faced with a higher situation of growth, higher uh, uh, situation of uh, hazards due to uh, climate uh, change. And uh, we need also here to adopt a more sustainable way of uh, dealing with nature. And uh, this is where also uh, we cannot uh, uh, treat this issue from the major cities. We have to go to intermediary cities to invent a new relation between human settlement and nature. And this is the place where this can be done with less damages. Uh, the, the, the last one is the need for a total rethink on how we are going to manage urbanization on this continent. And this is why we thought that it is important to focus our attention on intermediary cities as the key pillars of managing urbanization in a very rapid growing population situation. So it is very key that uh, uh, the Africity Summit uh, be seen as a place where we will reflect on how to bring to the table the position of Africa, uh, prolonging what uh, the African uh, Union has uh, accepted to present at uh, COP uh, at uh, Quito uh, when we discuss of the new urban agenda. And uh, remember, we were we said in Quito that it is not about managing urbanization and leaving behind rural areas. It's about managing human settlements across the country and across the continent and defining the way all the networks, all the places are connected from the rural to the intermediary, to the inter from intermediary to the uh, main cities in the country and from main cities to metropolitan areas for the region, connecting the continent to the world. So I think it is very important to notice that we ha will have to rethink the five main functions that any territory have to deliver to its population. Number one, feeding its population. So reflection on the food system sustainability is key. Number two, building its territory. It is important to think how we can reverse the trend that uh, uh, see that uh, 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 building is totally dependent on foreign uh, products and not on uh, the material that we we have on our on our localities. Third is uh, uh, 
bringing basic services to the population. And here we have a problem of rethinking the uh, what I call technological packages that we are using that were based on uh, the uh, reality of European cities, which is not our reality today because the uh, um, expansions, the sprawl, put us in a situation whereby these technologies can be non adapted to our, uh, to our situation. For example, if you take the city of Kinshasa, 8 million people, the extension of Lebanon, when can you think that this city will have a centralized sewage system to get our people out of bad condition of sanitation? So we have to invent new technical packages to address this issue of basic services. Fourth is how to maintain our infrastructure and equipment. And this is something that we need to address aggressively because as you saw, the poor maintenance gave us a return on investment that is very poor and gave us more burden on the way we address the uh, growth of our cities. And uh, they, we need to start education for maintenance at the intermediary cities so that it is embedded in the heads of our population. And the last one is governing the city, governing the territory. And here we have to reinvent because we, there, are, there is a serious lack of confidence between population and leaders. And at the intermediary city level, this is where we have to sue to uh, try and rebuild trust between the local governments, the public authorities, and the population. I stop here because my network is really, really poor. Thank you. Uh, excellent, uh, Jean-Pierre, for really coming up. Uh, you know, I think you can close the, the session here with your takeaway. What are the key things we should not forget when it comes to intermediary cities. And I think that you capture very well in terms of food system, building material, basic services, maintenance of those infrastructure services, and the governance of intermediary cities, and starting where we can manage intermediary cities being something that uh, could be manageable. So we thank you very much for that call and uh, the deep thought on how you have to rethink, you have to be humble. Uh, on han handling some of the challenges ahead from climate change, from uh, you know health crisis, and to re uh, you know realign ourselves. So very important messages that uh, I hope you're going to capture that and take with us not only through this webinar, but uh, reflecting upon them to work towards the successful African cities, the nine edition in May. So uh, that was my concluding note for the first uh, segment. Let me now turn to the second segment where we'll be hearing uh, from, uh, you know, the leading agencies who have uh, put together this uh, webinar uh, to hear what they, what will be their, their marching orders or what they expected from us so, so that we can really also reflect on that um, as we go into the discussions and the presentation. Uh, therefore, it's my honor to in invite uh, Mr. Raf Tutz, who is the Director of Global Solution Division, to give us his uh, views or perspectives uh, uh, so that we can take that forward. Mr. Tutz, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Remy, for the introduction. Thanks to Omar and Jean-Pierre for the inspiring words, I think, which set the stage for this um, this webinar. And uh, on behalf of UN Habitat, um, I'm really honored to participate here. I think it's very important that we get prepared for um, Afri cities in, um, in Kisumu in, um, in May. And, and the team on intermediary cities is, is critical indeed, uh, because we know that rural transformation and urbanization is leading to the further growth of these cities and that now already 210 million Africans live in an intermediate city in, in Africa, in one of the 1,400 intermediary cities that the continent uh, has. 
And we must say that in many cases, uh, intermediate cities are indeed lagging behind. As uh, Jean-Pierre has said, in basic services, infrastructure, capacities, um, there's also often inadequate support from national government and not sufficient uh, formal employment opportunities and limited economic diversity and um, vulnerability to climate change as well, amongst other challenges. And one of these challenges, as uh, Jean-Pierre has also said, is the, that the pandemic has shown how relevant the universal access to healthcare services and, uh, is in intermediary cities and how restrictions to mobility between urban and rural areas can severely affect total entire sectors of the economy and of the food supply. So when empowered, intermediary cities can indeed play a very critical role in enhancing the balanced territorial development linking urban and rural communities and activities and vice versa. And intermediary cities can also act as service centers for rural and urban uh, populations and they play a major role in accessing goods and services. And they also strengthen food security systems by linking rural productions with urban areas and services. So now moving to habitat, we have um, undertaken interventions sus towards sustainable urbanization and the realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the New Urban Agenda. And those agenda recognize that urban and rural communities do not live in an isolation from another. In fact, our strategic plan, uh, which will now uh, last until 2025, is defining the focus areas of reduced spatial inequality and poverty in communities across the urban rural continuum and also enhanced prosperity of cities and regions. These are two out of the four priorities of our uh, strategic plan and they all contribute to resilient and sustainable urban and rural development. So um, since the UN Habitat Assembly in May 2019, uh, member states have adopted a resolution on urban rural linkages uh, within the framework of guiding principles and frameworks for action, which was adopted by 40 different organizations. And in implementing this resolution, we are undertaking three key activities. One is supporting and encouraging countries in integrating urban rural linkages in their policies and plans. Second, raising awareness on urban rural linkages to member states. And third, collecting and disseminating best practices on urban rural linkages. Now, partnerships are very important to further highlight different dimensions of this topic. And last year, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the World Union of Wholesale Markets. And currently, we are undertaking discussions with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization to enhance sustainable food systems in the urban rural continuum with intermediate uh, cities as a key, uh, playing a key role. We also, in collaboration with Songyang County in China, we organized the second international forum on urban rural linkages, bringing together stakeholders working in urban rural continuum, including intermediary cities, okay. to share practices and develop recommendations for policies, plans and programs. And finally, in support of the Italian presidency of the G20, UN Habitat and OECD launched a platform on territorial development and sustainable development goal localization. As I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, we do recognize that urban and rural areas cannot be separated, cannot be considered in isolation, and intermediary cities play are a key in bridging the gaps between urban and rural communities and strengthening these linkages and promoting a system of intermediary cities will definitely contribute to positive urbanization that promotes productivity and prosperity. So let's make use of this opportunity that the webinar presents today 
to contribute on how the role of intermediary cities have in enhancing urban rural linkages and uh, this would be definitely a great contribution to the AfriCities Summit. So thank you so much for this opportunity and I wish you all the best with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raf, for these very important points on again really hammering uh, down the issue of the, the importance of territorial approach to, to uh, the work and how uh, UN Habitat that uh, is working in this area with the mandate given by member states because they uh, identify and really realize how this uh, the urban linkages are important and adding to the list of um, what uh, Jean Pierre had uh, uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the, the function of service center, uh, which is very essential, and uh, the proposal to look at um, you know the system of intermediary cities because you have a system of cities, but the system of intermediary cities that might be something you know the Afri cities may consider. How do you actually set up a such system? Perhaps the work that OECD UN Habitat have worked on establishing that platform on intermediary cities and the localization of uh, you know SDGs could go towards uh, such uh, effort. So thanks a lot, uh, sir, for this insightful. Um, uh, you know, highlights of UN Habitat work and some perspective of where we can go. Now, let me uh, turn to um, Kisumu uh, on behalf of the governor uh, who had not been able to, to join us, but has sent a really very able uh, person to, to convey uh, their expectations. So I honor to invite uh, Mr. Alois Aga, who is the special advisor to the governor and head of Africa Cities uh, Secretariat, and also a director of uh, Governor's Press Unit. So you could not, um, you know, uh, dream to have the person who knows in and out of everything to, to, to really tell us what uh, Kisumu expects uh, and what they stand for, and uh, how this uh, seminar webinar could help in shaping uh, really a successful uh, Africa Cities. So, um, Alois, you have the floor, sir. You are still on mute, eh? Yeah, on mute, I'm on mute. Sorry. Thank Go you. Ahead, uh, thank you, Remy. Uh, and uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all on the call. It is indeed a pleasure to join you here on behalf of His Excellency, the Governor of Kisumu County. Would have uh, really loved to be here, but uh, because of uh, certain unavoidable circumstances, he asked me to sit in for him and uh, present some of his thoughts with uh, at this webinar. And now, as uh, has been said uh, by Remy uh, in his opening remarks, Afri uh, Cities, the ninth edition, is uh, fast approaching its uh, finish line, uh, coming up in May, and. Uh, we couldn't be happier and clearer as we walk towards uh, that date. And uh, looking at uh, the, the theme of uh, this webinar and uh, in relation to the theme of the Afri Cities, they really speak to each other. So this coming uh, summit, uh, as you will appreciate, uh, will be a first in many ways because uh, most importantly, it will be the first summit to be held in a secondary city that we are discussing here today. Now, that then opens uh, the way to other secondary cities to play a, a crucial role, uh, you know, at, the, at this level, but it also presents a platform where secondary cities will take the lead in the discussion of affairs that directly affect, affect them at the summit. Now, as the host and on behalf of the governor, may I take this opportunity to assure you that Kisumu, and by extension, uh, the government of Kenya, has laid down uh, plausible measures to ensure that the ninth edition of our free cities will go down in history as the most memorable event of the free cities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me therefore to present some thoughts uh, as uh, presented by His Excellency. Although Africa is uh, the least abadite among the most uh, six continents, it uh, presents the greatest urban frontier uh, 
uh, it presents the greatest urban frontier experiencing rapid urbanization. In Africa, unlike in the development continents of America, Europe, and parts of Asia, the growth in urban population is mainly happening in small and medium cities. These are departure from urban primacy that has dominated the urbanization in most African countries where most urban growth were in major cities, mainly capital cities. This has been buttressed by rural urbanization migration in, uh, in search of opportunities such as high wage employment, better living standards, especially uh, in the years following attainment of independence by a number of African countries. This second uh, tier counties, mainly referred to as subnational cities, have in a way helped to ease pressure on the major capitals of Africa, whether you're talking about Democratic Republic of Congo's Lubumbashi and Kinshasa, um, Ghana's Tamale and uh, Takoradi on one hand, and Accra and Kumasi on the other, on the other hand, or Kenya's Kisumu, Nakuru and Eldoret on one hand, and Nairobi on the other. The dispersal in urban growth is also explained in part by a system of governors that uh, place subnational cities to under the jurisdiction of respective semi-autonomous local and regional governments. In acting as checkers to urban primacy, intermediary subnational cities provide avenue of stepping down the positive impacts of urbanization and easing the pressure on capital and first-year cities. They provide alternative spaces for economic development, employment creation, arresting the rural urban migration into the capitals, um, um, into the capital and or capital cities. On a regional scale, intermediary cities help to interlink rural spaces that occur between them. This provides opportunities for movement of supplies such as food, water, and even labor, especially in the peri-urban areas. While on the other hand, the rural areas benefit from market for agricultural products, especially food and raw materials for industries. The best way to maximize then on the benefits of connectivity of intermediary cities with other or the surrounding rural hinterlands is through effective policy and legal framework. For instance, in the Kenyan case, the constitution and other laws provide for devolved system of governance and how they are to be managed and governed. The County Government Act 2012 provide for, for formulation of five-year county integrated development plans and 10-year county special plans that help in directing development accordingly. The special plan in particular helps, among other things, to help maintain a balance between rural and urban areas, including sustainable exploitation and utilization of natural resources. Other laws include the Urban Areas and Cities Act that provides for classification of urban areas into markets, towns, municipalities, and cities, and the governance and administration of those urban areas. This helps to create order, first within the urban spaces and between the urban areas and surrounding rural or very urban areas. The policy and legal framework also acts to avert negative or unhealthy relationship between the urban and rural spaces. For instance, Properly done special plans address issues of uh, exploitation of rural natural resources like water, quarries, ETC, uh, and pollution through poor and ineffective solid waste management. In this past system of gov governance like what we have in Kenya, where we find local governments that have cities and rural hinterland living side by side, there must be a system of integrating the two for sustainable development. In Kisumu, the city seats at the apex, or Kisumu city seats at the apex of the county urban system. Its management and governance anchored on integrated strategic urban plan and local physical and land use development, which highlights how the city relates to its surrounding areas, including the smaller urban areas. These are deliberate steps to ensure that management for the city and urban areas are effectively managed for efficient service delivery. Together with Kisumu City, the sub counties, the sub county urban system is well connected through the, that pl uh, planning framework. Having looked at the roles played by intermediary cities, it's noteworthy to point out that the balance between urban and rural interface need not to be destabilized to ensure harmony. From the issues argued above, 
the role of intermediary cities cannot be overemphasized, whether within the national framework or subnational or regional level. That the frontiers for African urbanization presents opportunity for uh, sustainable urban development in Africa, but only with deliberate efforts. As such, therefore, full attention needs to be given to the secondary cities through resource allocation for infrastructure and institutional capacity development for effective service delivery. Kisumu, like other intermediary cities of Africa, must therefore be encouraged to embrace sustainable urbanization as this will be the only way their roles uh, in responding to global agenda, such as the D uh, SDGs, will be appreciated. As I conclude, may I take this very special opportunity to once again welcome you to Kisumu for the ninth edition of the Africity Summit coming up in May. As we begin the journey in earnest of celebrating the role of intermediary cities in addressing sustainable ur urbanization, and the delivery of SDGs, especially in this last decade of its implementation. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ado, for really putting, uh, uh, giving the impetus uh, to us how uh, the role of intermediary cities, not only the functions, but the positive contributions that are sometimes um, uh, underrated or so not appreciated enough. So as you concluded by saying, let's celebrate what intermediary city had, had to offer and had, as we continue to be offering to, this, you know, to deliver the sustainable development uh, goals and other agenda, this is well uh, noted. So we, we, we appreciate a lot and also took note of your call for more coherence in policy, policies that will be conducive to really empower uh, uh, intermediary cities to perform better, uh, especially in the context of what you call the subsidiarity, the support system that they require. So let me now, um, I can see uh, that Rose is becoming a bit impatient since uh, uh, Mr. Agar was already talking about the, you know, the regional dimension. Um, since you, uh, you, Rose, who is the next speaker, is the Secretary General of East African Local Government Associations, uh, tell us a bit more what that means, what Africities mean for the region, the East African region, and how it can really empower uh, maybe what uh, Ralph had called for, the, the network of intermediary cities in the region. So over to you, Rosa Gamwera. Thank you very much, Remy, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to the, uh, the uh, participants on this call. I want to really thank you for having invited me to be part of this very valuable conversation around our intermediary cities and around our African cities. I must say that um, as a person working in the East African region, we really feel proud that Kisumu has taken on this great responsibility of uh, hosting us come May in Kisumu. And the beauty of it for us at the East African region is the fact that we are going to showcase the capabilities that come with having empowered local governments, but more so going within the theme of the Afri Cities events and the theme of today, the fact that there is an intermediary city that has something to show in terms of what it's able to do. If it can host Afri Cities, what much more can it bring on board in terms of the expected uh, service delivery agenda? So definitely um, intermediary cities are at the heart of what we do in the region. And uh, of course, I'll talk a little bit more about county and local governments, as we call them in East Africa. What we are doing as uh, an umbrella body for the national entities that represent counties and local governments in East Africa is leveraging from the whole discussion of making sure that the ESC policies and protocols are responsive to we, the county and local governments, and what we have to offer. Remy and uh, colleagues on the call, we must not forget that cities and local governments are indeed a product, but also an avenue through which our governments get to deliver on their charter to the people the, in terms of development agenda as well as government systems. So we should not be leaving the cities alone. And this is our message at the regional level. We are telling the member states, particularly in the ESC region, and hoping 
to cascade that message up to the Africa level that we are supposed to be partners in this process. Your regional policies should be able to make it possible for the devolved entities to deliver on them. Because, for example, in the ESC, they're talking about a people-centered development process. And where are these people? These people are in the cities, they're in the intermediary cities, and they're in the rural. So uh, the fact that we have intermediary cities on the scene amplifies the importance of the linkages. You are going to cross from the city, big cities, metropolitans. You will end up, as you transit with your goods and the people are moving in the region to grow development, and end up in the rural, where the last person you're looking for in the integration agenda rests. So definitely we find that this whole trajectory has to be placed on table. You have to have the representatives as part of the regional discussion and dialogue, and therefore take it forward. I will revert back to what the role of intermediary cities, particularly within the context of Africa cities and today's scene. Uh, how are they relevant for the Agenda 2030, Agenda 2063? Uh, but also, I'll bring it down to our interest, Agenda of the ESC. We believe that if they are empowered, if they're given the right policy framework in terms of empowered, um, um, uh, the previous speaker talked about the devolution policies, we must be able to invest to make sure that these are working for the cities if we are going to get the expected deliverables for them. So we want the governments to remember that, and I hope our free cities can really amplify that, that we need the strong commitment and involvement of our government to make what we have to deliver as cities and local governments possible. We need to make sure that they have the right resources. Uh, we've talked about the fiscal resources. We know that um, with regional development agenda, there are issues around uh, matters that affect our fiscal decentralization policies. Some tariffs have to go away, means loss of revenues. So we need to work with these cities to make sure that there are alternative alternatives to those funds that we may lose, or even better, funds to be able to respond to things like infrastructure development. I know, for example, in the ESC, there's a lot of infrastructure development going on to build connectivity. Roads are happening, but we are working on the regional and national roads and kind of forgetting the city and local government roads. Can we factor this? Because it enriches. You will, not, you will need to get to the last part of the rural, to get the food from there, to get the person, the labor you'll need to come on board to grow your industries from the rural. So you need to build these linkages. And where are you, where are you going to make that the epicenter? The intermediary cities, incidentally, when you observe the growth, these kind of are, they come through a natural process. When people move and settle in an area, then somehow it grows and develops. If I look at the Ugandan situation, we had the villages, they became town boards, they became towns, municipalities, and today we are talking about cities. We've come up with 10 new cities. So this evolution speaks to the process of development, which should not be forgotten at the regional level when they're working out the regional development agenda, right up to scaling it to the global development agenda. So we need to work around the intermediary cities because we are looking for the industries to grow development in the region. The, the intermediary cities provide these facilities. Can we make sure that the facilities are appropriate and responsible to these industries? The markets, the, the, the growth of the region is dependent on the products being able to be sold across the region. So the markets are going to be found in the intermediary cities, most probably as the areas closest to the people. Uh, you're going to find issues of employment. People are supposed to move freely and get employment. But when they move freely and to get this employment, the first stop will be that intermediary city because it is affordable, because it's quickly accessible. So we need to invest in these intermediary cities to make sure that they speak to the purpose for which the people are presenting themselves for in terms of need, but also for which the region, the member states, the governments uh, expect the contribution to come from local government. So basically, I think the message is well crafted for Afri cities and uh, for this call. And I can't wait but to hear a little bit more from the paper presenters on what is on ground that we need to work out with. I liked the, the areas that uh, Mr. Tufts touched on 
because this is what we speak to as IALGA, issues of policy integration, very vital. The urban policies, actually that's one area. We need to come up with solid urban development policies. Um, kind of because of the ad hoc way through which our cities seems to be turning up, we tend to found them in the key devolution policies and we tend to forget that we need to carefully craft the urban spatial planning and development processes. We need to remember the physical planning and we need to remember the issue of partnership as being very, very critical because when we talk about territorial development, everybody has a role to play in that territory and we have all forms of actors in there, which equally the ESC as a region within which we work also kind of flags as high when they're talking about their consultative dialogue frameworks that bring on board partners, civil society and private sector. So there's a lot we can discuss and I'm looking forward to this, the continuation in this call, but also to Afri cities. I will say on behalf of Kisumu as well, that we can't wait to have you in Kisumu and further uh, unpack this whole subject. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rose. I think it's a, a full harvest uh, from our side. Uh, the importance of, um, you say, let's not just celebrate, but let's showcase. Uh, what uh, intermediary cities are able to do, the importance of devolution, uh, how that has helped uh, the region uh, to, to, fo to, to advance that topic and to remind us that it's all about people, what you call a people center. And I think that's a very important um, element to, to put in this discussion uh, and the, to, to also uh, emphasize the importance of um, physical, uh, fiscal decentralization uh, but also mobilization of um, local resources. And, and I like this idea that I would call a continuum of settlements uh, that you, tried to, you, you, bring, you brought into the discussion. And some colleagues who had worked in this area would know that the continuum of land rights, for instance, was very important to, to show that we are all in, we are all connected. And I also um, like the idea that you emphasize the, the importance of partnership. We, this thing cannot be done. Uh, separately, and a uh, partnership also means policy integration and coherence, as you hammer that out. I you present, start introducing or um, contributing to the next session that will look at the case study example and where you are illustrating the case of Kenya, Uganda, and East Africa in general. So now it's my pleasure uh, to turn to the third uh, leg or third segment of our um, uh, discussion this afternoon to look at uh, some country experiences, um, how we had been about, or some countries had managed to, to capture these elements of intermediary cities in the context of urban ruling cities to transform their territories in different ways. So um, uh, privilege to have uh, um, Professor Radwan, Hassan Radwan, from the, who is the director and of the School of Architecture, Planning and Design, um, and coordinator of, coordinator of Social Innovation Lab in Mohammed VI Polytechnic University in Morocco, uh, who will share with us uh, how, uh, in the context of Morocco in particular, rapid urbanization uh, had fueled uh, the growth of intermediary cities and the importance of rural uh, development. And I think it came earlier in uh, Rose's presentation was to talk about the rural transformation. So again, Professor Radwan, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, yes do, you, you. Do, do you hear me? Yes, hear me? Do you, you, do you hear me? The voice is good? The voice is good? There's a bit of echo, but uh, let's yes. see. Uh, okay, there is an echo now. Do you hear me, please? Hello? Hello? That's better. That's better. That's better. That's better. Yes, good. Yes, good. Uh, I'm trying to share my, uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, so um, I don't need an, a PowerPoint, maybe just um, to go through uh, things. All right. So, Remy, thank you for um, for this gathering, and I'm delighted and happy to see uh, to see that this event is taking place regarding intermediary cities. That is uh, indeed a very uh, strategic topic. Why? Uh, I may be a little bit, uh, as you know me, Remy, a little bit polemical, um, a little bit uh, create, you know, put some spice on the subject. I think. This term even of intermediary cities is a, is a problem because 
who should be intermediary, you know, uh, and why? Uh, and we're, when we, we look at different definitions, what means intermediary cities, it's just like little small towns. We ask them to play a role to connect between the giant urbanized areas, wild metropoles, and little, you know, poor rural areas. I think it's not fair to put such pressure on these settlements, let's actually use the generic term, human settlements, rather than just intermediary. And they have a joke in Morocco. Uh, uh, if you look at the map of Morocco, most of the cities are inter intermediary. <laughs> uh, most of the cities, you have Casablanca, wild urbanized area, taking almost 25% of the number of urban, urban density. Uh, and then the whole of Morocco is still intermediary. So we have more than uh, 50 intermediary cities if we define them by the number of population that are from like 10,000 to 1 million, if we may agree on the number. So th therefore, I think we need to be, sh to be very careful with the name intermediary. Intermediary means the number of population that will grow. Intermediary means temporality, that means we're waiting for this intermediary to be a real city, or intermediary in terms of economics, and we want that intermediary city to be more prosperous. And hence the dilemma. Uh, so what I may say, instead of using intermediary cities, this, uh, this kind of uh, growing human settlements, that they need to reach a certain urban maturity where you have security, human comfort, health and hygiene problems to be addressed, education, and of course, create also a value. The problem of intermediary cities in Africa, including Morocco, most of them, they have the title of being poor. They are not intermediary cities of opportunities, but they are intermediary cities of dormitory, uh, dormitory cities. Most of these intermediary, they are actually answering the need and the pressure of housing rather than uh, investing in technology, investing in infrastructure, investing in services, investing in global as well, linkage. How many intermediary small cities they created big, image internationally, and Rumi, you know very well, Ben Greer. Ben Greer is a little, if we may use intermediary cities, but thanks, thanks to a royal action, we set up one prestigious university there, and thanks to knowledge, thanks to education, we were able to promote this intermediary city from a level of just being poor to a level that is attracting investments, attracting tourists, attracting students. So therefore, what are the internal elements to promote the intermediary cities? But we cannot just say to the intermediary city to be at the, the standard. We need to see what the governmental, regional, balance system since in Morocco we pursue this re advanced regionalization to boost these intermediary cities in different regions in order to create an economic equity at the, the territorial level, which is the country. And I think we need to be very careful, like the case of Egypt, where we have 100 million and we have a wild Cairo, where you have now uh, officially 30 million. Why not? not to have these very wild urbanized areas with high uh, population density and create a regional balance. Therefore, intermediary doesn't mean uh, accidental cities. No, they are needed. We need more intermediary cities to have territorial equity, territorial balance, territorial innovation. And this is why very important to think about what kind of resources that they need to be distributed in a very equitable way at the national level. So to cut my story short, uh, I have slides, but they are not needed, honestly, because in this way I concentrate. So I have five points that we need to consider in these intermediary cities based on the case of Morocco. One, we need to consider 
that intermediary cities, they are so important and they are needed. Why? Because there is a sense of belonging and sense of identity. In the intermediary cities, most of the citizens, they are in the vicinity of that city or they belong to the rural area of that city. So for me, an intermediary city is better than Casablanca where you have immigrants coming from all over Morocco and they have no sense of belonging to that big metropole and they are losing their sense of belonging and sometimes they are getting weak. So therefore, the intermediary cities in Morocco, they are playing a major role. Number two, number two, I think this... Uh, uh, this quite of reg the advanced regionalization, how we can promote regions. And when we talk about the region, we talk about resources, we talk about landscape, we talk about a lot of elements of sustainability and resilience. I would underline in the third point, sustainability and resilience. Resilience is not just about catastrophes, but resilience, how to boost the immune system of communities in this uh, intermediary cities to play the role where people, they have that sense of belonging to create a real human establishments that they are sustainable. Very important. So we are not, we should not look at intermediary cities like a phenomenon that needs to be, uh, be a problem. Uh, like in French, we say la problématique. C'est pas une problématique. It's an opportunity. Intermediary cities are an opportunity. Please, we need to change the mindset. The big metropoles are the problem, you know? And these are, they created a misbalanced territorial one, like Raf has mentioned. This is why I would just mention the, the, the fourth point is actually intermediary cities in Morocco with evidence, they played major role in terms of COVID-19 in the time of crisis than in Casablanca. We may manage inter the myriad cities in terms of, of uh, health crises and, and like the case of COVID, like other ones. So therefore, resilience in intermediary cities is, is, is better than a metropole in Africa. Most of the metropoles in Africa, we just have large urbanization devouring resources, devouring uh, agricultural land. And this is the last point that I want to mention, intermediary cities are so important to keep the role of promoting agriculture. In Africa, we are an agriculture culture. So therefore, how can we sustain agriculture and how can we set food security? We cannot assure food security with Casablanca, Kinshasa, Cairo. Food security relies on these intermediary cities to, be in, to play an important role to activate the role of um, farmers and give them a decent life. So farmers, they are uh, they are scattered all around the land and they are in a very miserable conditions all over Africa. So we are giving them this chance of intermediary cities where they can find their services, they can find help, they can find lots of elements of comfort, and they are so important to support agricultural activity. And the, the last part, is actually natural landscape, natural landscape. Please, Remy, I would alarm my colleagues around. The more we are scattering this urbanization uh, all around and we are pushing intermediary to be big city, we may have economic profit by being big, but they are devouring resources. They are creating misbalance. So how can we shift the paradigm of intermediary cities from just looking at them intermediary stuck in a situation to intermediary. That means, um, uh, and we may change even the, the, the name of intermediary to, to settlements, human settlements that support the sustainable agriculture in Africa and support also the genius logic. Because most of these intermediary cities, we still have artisanal, we still have local know-how, we still have the sense of culture, because the more we get a metropole, it gets wild, like Casablanca. So we don't see the, 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 the sense of identity or culture. So therefore, culture is very essential in order to sustain life, an ecosystem of distant life, in order to sustain agriculture, and in order, of course, to create a distant um, realm for uh, uh, the living of people 
and thank you so much. I just wanted to shake the ground a little bit with my colleagues because all of us, we speak like slides, 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 intermediate, intermediary, intermediary, 10,000, 3,000, 1 million. Please, we need to change our mindset. Now the rural is the future. The big metropoles are the cause of all problems. So let us see intermediary rural urban settlements that they have all kind of comforts and thanks to technology thanks to smartness we can have electricity we can have wi-fi we can everywhere so i prefer now myself to live in the top of the mountains in morocco than live in one of the metropoles where there is a nightmare a nightmare and in the covid situation a, a farmer in one hectare was actually happier than a rich person in an apartment of 100 square meters in Casablanca. And thank you so much. Uh, Prof. Uh, Radwan, you always, uh, you know, nail so many things. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this. It's always passionate uh, when you speak without uh, PowerPoints, but uh, for those who have seen you speaking with PowerPoints, it's even, uh, it's another level. So let me just uh, maybe, uh, take a few points here that you are taking some notes that the, what you had uh, challenged us to, to rethink uh, really uh, what you mean by intermediary cities and i would say here that uh, from what we started by from from, from mr agar from celebration to rose to say let's showcase you are saying let's have a campaign campaign on um, the human settlements and to show the, all the benefits all the goodies uh, all the positive aspects that this type of territory settlements play uh, for, for many things. And again, to bring home the importance of life and the importance of nat nature-based solutions. That's, let's not just focus on the population growth or the economic growth, but the nature, the culture, the life is what you should be aiming for. And I really appreciate your, your five or six points where you again, as a takeaway, we, uh, as we move to African cities, that we should always uh, remember. And you have really some important keywords here. Resilience, we should not forget. The regionalization is important. The issue of identity, belonging is critical. Let's think of opportunities that those settlements have rather than the challenges, the context of ability to manage, and you use the example of COVID, and the importance of agricultural food system in this in our culture, in many intermediary cities, especially in Africa, that's what matters most and we should not uh, uh, forget. And how do we now, what you say, let's go back to the future and if that future is rural uh, and we have to really have, uh, harness uh, the opportunity of uh, technology innovation to make that work. So thanks a lot for this excellent um, insight and contribution. And we look forward to hearing more later and for your active contribution to our cities. Now Thank it's you. my Thank honor uh, to, to invite um, Dr. Ab uh, Abdul Hussein, who is a town planner, geospatial analysis and coordinator of MINA uh, GCIF uh, in initiative. Uh, his uh, bow will be uh, posted. My good friend from MINA is also the secretary general of the ministry. So. Um, and we have done a lot of work, and this is one of the, the, Afri the African champions I've seen in, on this issue of intermediary uh, cities and urban rural linkages. So, um, and he had done a lot of work, so we'd like to hear a bit more your reflection and some of your, your messages we can maybe take note of as you prepare for African cities. Uh, Dr. Thank Abdul, you. you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear you well, sir. Thank you very much. Uh... It's good to be behind so that at least you can learn from other experiences. And I think I would also like to talk directly, even though I prepared a slide. I like the passion of the last presenter. Uh, and I remember the one of the Africa City Summit was hosted by Casablanca. And uh, really, I was there. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you here. Uh, what he raised fundamentally exactly is what MENA, the capital of Niger State, is serving. Interestingly, MENA is really being affected directly by what is really among of these dominant cities like Abuja, uh, which is very close. In fact, for the purpose of record, uh, Remy, you are aware of the location of Suleja and Abuja, and then how MENA is. So most of the problem in Abuja, 
living me is transferred to this small city. Mina was established around 2019, uh, by 2010, it serves 10, yeah, 100 years. So I would like to go with that and then to give a very small background on maybe for the purpose of knowing Niger State is serving, you know, uh, one of the largest, if I have in the 10% of the land area. And then it's well located centrally. And that is where Mina being centrally located is also, it has served as hope of rail line in Nigeria. In fact, the first locomotive that move around in Nigeria is right now in Mina. Unfortunately, most of the old history is now, they're almost gone. And that is where we need to look at what is happening at these intermediary cities. The challenge which I have noticed over the last 15, 20 years that I have served with the government is the lack of ability or weak enforcement processes in making these intermediate cities very effective. Unfortunately, if they are staying, or, you know, located very close, a kind of urban, uh, like a dominant city like Abuja, then whatever that cannot be done in Abuja will be easily done in that intermediate city. And that's why we have Suleja. All the problem, people use that as a dormitory in the morning, they move to Abuja and Abuja and they come back because there is weak enforcement, lack of resources to do the necessary planning process and implementation, and people from the major cities have the money to come to the rural area and do what we call this land grabbing. People now will turn in sort of looking, and that's one of the challenges, but I think we need to look at the possibility, how can we bring real effective governance when it comes to land administration? People are looking at it as, as investment. So they will come and dispossess the local people, buy land in very big amount, and then after a period, they will now uh, start selling. And by the end of the day, these rural people that are living in this area will be dispossessed. The implication is what? Farming activity with time will become very difficult. Most of these people are farmers because they don't have money. One hectare is going for one million naira. Just I want you to convert. Then after 10 years, the same one million naira that you sold your one hectare of land will go for 300 million naira. You now have farm to uh, land to farm and so on. So these are some of the challenges in which the relationship between this intermediary cities or whichever name we want to call it. It's not only at that level. I like the way he really said, forget about the number. What is the population? No. Where are they located? How is their relationship? How can we make it effective by providing a very simple, easy to follow procedure that can work? So that is what really is happening. And we have looked at so many things. And like you mentioned, yes, we are part of the, uh, uh, should I say, we are participating in this over the linkages, uh, Niger State. And we have seen some of the effort, which really is giving a direction. For instance, one of the key takeaway from the new urban agenda is that we stop talking about stop talking about this urban and regional planning, urban and rural. No, how do we look at this relationship? It's a kind of continuum, because when you say rural or urban, we are trying to bring a kind of dichotomy. Uh, but we have something somewhere that is related and relevant to the other person. If you are talking about farming. Even if you're doing 500 kilometers away from a settlement, there is a link of flow of this commodity into this area. How do you integrate that? And that is where regional development plan usually comes about. We have really been taking this for granted and trying to give this dichotomy uh, urban plan, urban plan. And then the emphasis is more on urban, 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 without looking at rural. So when you bring rural there, you put it as if it's rural development. Then you take it geographically without looking at it. It's part of part and parcel of planning. Until we look at this relationship, and that is where the concept of territorial planning, instead of over regional planning, town um, planning, town country planning, all these are, you know, trying to bring division. And somebody will go to university and will look at his field after graduating as if it's only in urban area that he can work. Without knowing that he should be a very, in fact, I used to tell my student, if they are looking for anybody, for recent an advertisement, let's see, World Bank, looking for a sustainable development, especially, and you have planning degree, and you think you are not relevant, then you don't know your field. Because by your training, you are taught to you are, you are taught to look at the relationship between all the components that will make human settlement efficient, aesthetic, and also safe. Then who is that person that can work sustainably if not you? So these are some of the things. And I think we must uh, appreciate what you have done there. And then the another initiative of you are happy that is the overall linkages, which really uh, brought this idea of looking at so many things that. Whatever you are doing in the urban area, 
is dependent on something in rural area. And rural area also need this. So instead of allowing this, we've been talking for a very long time, people are moving over, over, over migration from the context of geographic analysis. But overall, like is looking at what is the actual relationship in a manner that it shouldn't be so. You need to improve the rural area for them to be able to do what is necessary to keep the urban area alive, active, and also sufficient. I think this two innovation, which you have that is really championing, I must commend you for that. So when you look at what is happening, uh, this issue of divide between the urban and rural is really creating a lot of problems. People are moving because and when you go to town, you can't afford to live there. Then you need to live on marginal areas. So instead of So many things when you move to urban areas, infrastructure can never be provided. Most of the areas, like I mentioned, they are on marginal spaces. It's everywhere. You go to Kenya, we have one of the most outstanding areas that when you are taking a reference, you will mention that, uh, I forget the name, in Kenya, the same thing when you come to Nigeria, you go to Lagos, you go to Abuja, and then of course you come to Mina, you have known most of these Papunguru, Barik and Sale, which you are very familiar with, uh, Mr. Lim. So these are some of the challenges which uh, are issue. If you look at based on statistics, what is really happening for the purpose of record, Niger State, we have almost 77% rural. And then, of course, they will call us or because what is there? And let me share this uh, important because I think this is a very good place. But looking at African cities coming up, could you believe anywhere by it? You might be buying share butter that originated from Niger State. But where is in Kenya, is it is in Ghana, or even taking as far as Japan? And then it will be packaged without the people that are really doing this work benefiting fundamentally. And that's why you look at the percentage of people that are poor, almost 77%. 40% of the buildings in these rural areas do not have access to electricity. 29% have no sanitation facility. This is the reality. But what do we need to do to improve this? And one thing that we know, which we have seen in the list, so what we have done, most of these share water streets, just on their own, they've been there for the past 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. There is no any deliberate policy. And these are some of the oversight that I think as government, we need to look at how do we sustain some of the things that we have inherited? Because somebody defines sustainable development as enough for all forever. Unfortunately, we are not looking at it for that forever. We made this share water streets. What are we doing as a people, as professionals, to make sure that those that are coming up after us will also be free? This is the problem. While literacy rate in rural areas of Niger State is at 8.5 percent, these are some of the issues that I think we need to look at. So this is the complex relationship between urban and rural areas in Niger State, and that is what really is the, the motivation behind urban rural linkages in Niger State. And then what are the issues? If you know, of course, what are the major link between urban rural linkages? As it affects sustainable development goals, goal 11, goal 2, goal 9, goal 10, all of this, if we are able to solve this, we'll get what we are looking for. And with this solid work, like you mentioned, to look at the relationship, MINA is an intermediate city, very good one. But there are, like um, the last speaker mentioned, there are other smaller settings. If I should tell you something, could you believe in the last two weeks we had a meeting? And this is some area, one area that I think, we, I think is across Africa. I know in Congo, why are we having crisis? Most of the crisis we are having in most of this Africa are not as a result of anything more than resources. Somebody told me in Mina, the Mina that you know, Dr. Remy, inside the market of Mina, they are selling gold worth a billion naira, billion. But, so then why, and then do you know where they are mining? These miners are all informal. They are just doing. And that is why we have this crisis. So based on what we do, we not fix some markets within the area. We have in Mina, we have in Beji, we have in Uganda, we have in Mariga. We want to see the level of influence of this market. Believe me, we saw scenarios. For instance, Mariga, which is about 170 kilometers from Mina. Could you believe people as far as Lagos on a market day, if you know the flow of resources, when we talk of money, you'll be surprised. So how do we harness this kind of resources that people from the rural area you know, real villages will come to that market, 
they will keep it at a very technical price. There is no control and so on and so forth. So these are some of the things that we look at and then we raise the awareness. We're able to mark what they have and to show this of influence, for example, from Mariga up to Abuja, from Mina up to other areas, and then to see what can we improve. Because they are alive. They develop, they farm this produce, but they don't value, they don't benefit from it. And that is one of the key reasons why we have uh, some of this uh, budgetary attack. But there are other areas to improve these rural areas. One of the you are aware when we when you came, we we'll talk about the Nigeria and support program. There are some of these rural areas what they need is very really minimal, and then you can turn around their life and they will never go to the city because when they go, they don't have anything. Electricity is one. And by the intervention of you know, European Union and uh, GIZ, they started this program, what they call the Nigerian Energy Support Program, where they identify. And one interesting thing, uh, Dr. Remy, the selection process up to now, I just, one of the areas that we went, there was, was no way you will have gotten electricity for the next 20 years. But they had this opportunity. I think GIZ spent almost one or something million to provide that and then to Now it's not free. And that is why we need to recalibrate our processes of implementing urban policies, especially at the city that we're within them. The same villagers that we think they don't know what they are doing, they are managing buying their prepaid card and paying for this service, and nobody is complaining, and this is working. And I think it's important thing we look at it, how do we uh, move forward? And then we also have, and what is the effect of that? Of course, just because of electricity, the value of land has increased and then people are not moving. And then there is this rural access and mobility program by World Bank. This is something very, you can look at it, what the rural person is looking for, just a bridge to connect one community to the other is more important thing than anything. Lack of this culvert of bridges. I went to a village about a year ago. They called me doctor, doctor, doctor. They thought I was a medical doctor. After about a week, somebody called me the snake, but uh, because we, you have to enter water, a stream, and then somebody called me, and we left there about three days. Ah, doctor, uh -huh. a, a snake. There's somebody inside the water that they, they don't have any way. And if you know the kind of produce, rice. Mm. So this is something that I believe by providing access. Then we also did this on Slummy, which you are aware of. There is a small project which we have started, and the government has taken it up. And which we are sending to the faculty. This also is one area. So if we can look at some of this low-hanging fruit, to improve the life of not only the city dwellers, but also the rural people, which will go a long way in improving some of this. And then, but there are some challenges which we have faced, and we're facing and most of the most recent one, of course, we are aware, this bandit attack and kidnapping. If you are coming to Nigeria now, one of the key things they will tell you is don't move. If you are in Abuja or Lagos, don't move far away from the area. And this is affecting not only planning, plan implementation, and then so many other things. But what are the cons uh, consequences of this? People are really moving away. And that is why we need to look at that. And we have seen the result. We have seen the figure. One thing that is happening, people are farming, but they cannot harvest. And they will go and burn this thing. So until we have peace and security, this will keep affecting not only the intermediate city, but even rural area. And this is an issue that we know. We must look at the court, the really the main, uh, should I say, motivating factor that is leading this kind of crisis. Then we have identified something called focus of maybe some of the key gaps that I think we need to take note of, how do we move forward if we are to improve not only the intermediate cities, but also these rural areas. You can manage what you can manage. For instance, we have looked at this issue of data. Accurate data on the development channel of each of these local government is lacking. We have to find local government. We need to look at how do we move in doing that, no matter how little. And I can appreciate, I will appreciate the you know, support the encouragement and direction by you and Okay. I think the sign of <clears throat> freezing is that uh, we have to maybe stop here, Dr. Abdul. I don't know. If you close this uh, one, as we are running it short, and I was very passionate, but I hope it, uh, everyone will stay on but just to hammer uh or maybe summarize a few points that caught my attention the importance of enabling frameworks um including <clears throat> having the governance system to, to manage that the integrated plan the policies 
um, uh, and many other things. But the issue that he brought us uh, to consider, including mobility, managing the settlements, you use the example of um, a slum, uh, electrification, uh, electricity, rural electrification, for instance. And the, again, along the line of opportunities, how do we harness and invest in uh, some of these settlements, uh, considering the, the importance they play for value chain? Um, and that is not always coming back in terms of royalty. I think, Prof. Um, Abdul, uh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, you know, the pointers and the concrete example, and I will not finish with. Uh, before mentioning the, the new things that you have uh, uh, added to the discussion so far, the importance of data in, yeah. to inform the thing, the importance of land, and the importance of peace and security. All these things cannot happen without some of these uh, elements. So again, thanks a lot, Dr. Abdul. As we move towards um, the next uh, speaker, um, which I will be encouraging uh, speakers to try to respect the time and con at the other can contribute in the chat. So it's my honor to, inv to invite uh, Dr. Robert uh, Sangori, who is the uh, Deputy Director of Urban Development uh, at the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development in Kenya, uh, to present maybe uh, the, the context of Kenya, especially the, the devolution, which had been quite um, dynamic in, this, uh, in Kenya. I don't know if uh, Dr. Sangori, can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Remy, and uh, all protocol of SAT. Let me have my camera on. Go ahead, we can hear you, we can see you. Okay, thank you. Uh, allow me just to say from the onset that uh, the presentation I want to make uh, was to be done by director, National Director for Urban Development, uh, Dr. Charles Kojango, but due to some uh, pressing matters, I would do this on, uh, on his behalf. And as been mentioned, um, Dr. Robert Sangori uh, from the State Department for Housing and Urban Development, uh, the Republic of Kenya. And of course, uh, the co-host uh, of uh, the Afri Cities, and uh, we welcome uh, all guests uh, on board to Kenya. Uh, together with the Kisumu city, who already have invited uh, uh, the, the guests to, to visit the lakeside city. Uh, I, I would uh, rush through the presentation. I don't know if I can share the screen or I just uh, speak uh, off the screen. Remy? If you can, you can share or we can share on your behalf. I don't know. Grace? Okay, let me... Shall we share if uh, you have some challenges? I will ask my colleagues to, I think you shared the presentation before, so I will ask them to, to also attempt to share, if that works. Mm. Uh, do you have the presentation? Or I, I share it? If you're happy, you share it. Or you speak you speak to the points, the key messages. Okay. Uh, let me speak to let me speak to the points uh, of the key messages that uh, that I want to bring out. Uh, Yeah, so uh, the, the, the issues that uh, I want to raise in this discussion uh, relates to the historical you know, perspective of the rural urban linkages in Kenya, and of course the impact of uh, devolution, uh, the challenges experienced under the national and uh, international strategies on rural urban development uh, linkages uh, in that uh, uh, kind of context. Uh, just to start with, uh, as we may all be aware that uh, Kenya is uh, at a point of implementing a robust, uh, you know, uh, constitution uh, which uh, uh, was ushered in in 2010, and this brought the aspect of, uh, of devolution. And uh, with the aspect of devolution, now the key functions that then the citizenry are, uh, are, are looking towards are being addressed by the two uh, level of government, that is the national government and the 47 county government. 
Uh, but besides this, uh, we also have uh, the lower tire uh, within uh, the uh, within the revolved systems where we are having the you know the cities, the municipalities, and uh, the secondary towns uh, in this arrangement where now. Uh, then forms the, uh, the point of discussion here in terms of the intermediary cities and their role uh, in economic development across the country. Uh, I therefore would like to, to mention that uh, within the historical you know, perspectives of the rural urban linkages, uh, there, there are four uh, main uh, you know, uh, discussion areas which if time was there would have been dealt with uh, in details, but I'll just uh, highlight a few points around each of these. Uh, starting with the sessional paper number 10 of 1965, uh, and then the rural urban development strategy of 1971, we also have, uh, you know, a key point uh, to address in terms of uh, what we have as the district focus focus for rural, you know, development strategy of 1994, and then there's the rural trade and production center strategy of 1996. And within uh, these frameworks, uh, for instance, there's Session of paper number one, uh, number 10 of 1965, which was dubbed the African Socialism and its Applications, uh, which then uh, you know, ensured that the country's wealth would remain in their productive areas, uh, including the former white islands, uh, white highlands, and those covered by early registration under this, what then we had as the Swanton uh, Plan. Uh, it also asserts that uh, uh, to make the economy grow as fast as possible, uh, then the development funds would be invested where it would yield the largest increase in net output. But then uh, this approach, of course, as been as seen, uh, clearly favored the development of areas endowed with natural resources, uh, good land and rainfall, transport and power facilities, while areas without such facilities continue to lag behind. Uh, and again, uh, in terms of uh, what then we have as the rural urban development strategy of 1971, uh, Kenya's rural development strategy, you know, evolved uh, over time uh, by embracing two major, you know, components of in 1980s. Uh, uh, what then we have as the district focus strategy uh, uh, in the period of 1984, 1988. Uh, this made the dis the district. You know, then uh, as the you know the operational centers for rural development, uh, and then of course the rural urban balance strategy of 1986, which uh, uh, then uh, provided the framework with which uh, the rural development strategy uh, was found to then integrate uh, uh, to have to to, uh, to embrace the integrated approach uh, to planning and uh, emphasizing you know the effective. Uh, implementation of both the district focus and rural urban balance uh, strategies. Uh, by this, uh, there were key points which uh, were focused on, including you know increasing location of light agro-based industries in the rural areas and small town, uh, uh, which then provided in, uh, in, you know immediate market for agricultural produce and uh, raw materials uh, to industries. Uh, the second point here is that. Uh, uh, this frameworks, you know, increased promotion of industrial investment in rural areas, uh, but at the same time, of course, increasing the spatial pattern of urbanization in close linkages uh, to agricultural resource base as a shift from the urban primary structure uh, which were pursued in the past. Uh, with this, uh, I, I bring uh, the, out the issues which were raised in the third category of uh, this uh, historical perspective of policy frameworks, uh, what we have as the rural trade and production centers strategy for 1986, and uh, with this, uh, you know, it envisaged uh, the e economic management, you know, in a renewed uh, uh, manner uh, to the point that uh, the, the 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 economic strategy to the year 20, 2000 uh, aimed at promoting the development of the urban system that supports uh, growth of agriculture and development of rural areas at the same time. But again, uh, at the same time, generated uh, generating productive, you know, employment opportunities in non-farm activities for rural workers uh, closer to where they, they lived. Of course, the strategy introduced the rural trade and production centers, which then, uh, uh, within this period, uh, the government at the time, you know, pursued several regional development policies, uh, which included the rural urban balance, uh, rural. Uh, growth with the distribution uh, linkages of physical and sectoral sect, uh, uh, sectors and efficient you know manpower policies 
uh, in the context of the district focus for rural development, which was another strategy adopted in 1994, uh, especially in 1983, uh, the district focus for rural development strategy with the district as the basic unit for planning at uh, you know the local level, uh, which provided for you know uh, under the theme of mobilizing domestic resources for equitable development. Uh, it formalized the organizational uh, strategy for planning and implementation of rural development by shifting the planning and implementation responsibility from headquarter ministries to the district uh, level as uh, the focal unit of development. Uh, at the same time, you know, the district fo uh, focal strategy, focal strategy uh, was based on the principle of complementary, you know, relationship between ministries responsible for sectoral approaches to development and districts where various sectors are joined uh, you know, in common support of rural uh, development activities. So uh, with those, uh, therefore, uh, there are several other you know, intermediary policies in between, but those four areas uh, were key in terms of looking at the perspective, you know, the linkages of the rural development as we shift to, to, to the urban development. And therefore, this brings us to the aspect of uh, the devolution, which of course we started with at the introduction, uh, with the uh, uh, promulgation of the new constitution uh, in 2010, and uh, you know the the issue of uh, the intermediate cities, the rural development, rural economics, rural service, you know provision and migration from rural to major uh, urban uh, urban areas uh, becomes into focus, and uh, one of the issues that. Uh, I bring at this point is uh, the issue of the impact of uh, the devolution on the you know the growth of the intermediate cities, and uh, as the constitutional uh, provision provides uh, in Article 184, of course provides you know for uh, the manner in which uh, the the urban institutions then be managed in Kenya, and uh, just to highlight that uh, the four intermediate cities of Kenya, notably Mombasa, Kisumu, Nakuru, and Eldoret. Uh, have uh, in the past you know witnessed successful growth uh, since devolution and this uh, you know has allowed them to to aid neighboring areas uh, you know uh, within the country uh, and uh, this uh, again at the same time uh, you know has led to the enhancement of citizens access to basic services uh, leading to significant success in the fields of you know uh, agriculture health uh, trans uh, and transport uh, among other devolved units and uh, in the principle of uh, you know you know leave no one behind, which of course past speakers have alluded to uh, within the principles of the new urban agenda, uh, you find that uh, we cannot delink uh, you know the growth of uh, our cities, uh, the intermediary you know cities, uh, from uh, you know how the rural areas are also managed because it, the success of the intermediate cities depends on the stability in the rural areas. And of course, this is what uh, uh, you know, the counterpart uh, Hassan in his presentation brought the issue of uh, you know, the future is in the rural areas. But uh, that is debatable uh, because uh, uh, as, as we look at the development, uh, you know, this is a point that is then driven that uh, as we look at uh, our Kenyan context, you find that uh, most of the rural areas, uh, which some are disadvantaged in terms of uh, the economic prosperity, and uh, with emerging issues like climate change, we have what then we have currently as uh, you know the climate refugee. Now, where does the climate refugee find uh, refuge? At the same time, they find refuge in uh, the intermediary towns. Uh, they tend to move away from uh, you know the rural areas, thinking that uh, you know uh, they are disadvantaged and lack the means to. You know, you know, sustain uh, their economic prosperity with the hope to getting uh, rescue within uh, the cities. But uh, at the same time, if our cities, if not then well managed, then these people's adversaries continues. So this is a debate that uh, uh, then continues uh, in, in this front. Uh, the other aspect that uh, uh, we are bringing out is the impact uh, of revolution again directly on the rural development. And uh, just to quickly mention that. Uh, Enhancement of citizen oversight over rural le uh, uh, leadership is, is a key issue. And uh, you realize that uh, in Kenyan context, with the devo devolution, where we are having 45, you know, 47 you know, county governments, in other words, 47 governors, 
uh, who are uh, you know in charge of their jurisdictions uh, including you know the oversight done by the senators who are also you know for seven terms of elected of course we are also having nominated senators but then uh, uh, besides that, at the lower level, we still have the county assemblies, of course, besides the national assemblies at the, at the national uh, government, and all this, you know, face intense public scrutiny at the same time, uh, uh, you know, and they are under pressure to deliver uh, uh, in terms of uh, what the citizens need, and of course, accountability in terms of the governance uh, structures that uh, are to accompany this. Addressing, you know, the issues of recurring social problems, uh, you know, in areas which were previously neglected, uh, therefore, is a key role that uh, devolution uh, in Kenya is, is is trying to play, and uh, there seems to to, to, to be you know uh, concurrence that uh, devolution is uh, providing that level playing field uh, for uh, growth of even both rural rural areas vis-a-vis -vis what then we have as rural towns uh, uh, it, it is kind of arrangement uh, the issue of uh, the impact uh, in terms of the economies uh, of rural areas uh, is, is, is something that uh, then uh, is critical at this stage again in Kenya's perspective and uh, you know and, uh, the, in terms of increasing uh, uh, economic uh, development and performance in the rural areas. Uh, this, uh, you know, is exhibited by, uh, in terms of the technological, if we integrate technology, including uh, uh, satellite imagery data, and uh, of course, uh, nighttime uh, luminosity, uh, this such technologies helps uh, uh, present, represent economic performance over the rural areas uh, in Kenya. But then there's also the issue of the increased markets uh, provision, uh, including, of course, smallholder farmers, agri, agri uh, pastoralists, and uh, rural enter entrepreneurs, uh, which all benefit from uh, the aspect uh, of devolution uh, due to the resources which have been devolved further uh, from the national government, uh, which then provide balance to areas that then would have uh, been left behind uh, in, in this kind of uh, situation. Uh, the other aspect that uh, uh, we bring out uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, improved access to assets, technologies, and services for vulnerable, you know, the vulnerable uh, groups, uh, members of the society like we, uh, women and youths, uh, this has tried to be to be balanced uh, with the, with the you know onset of devolution in Kenya. Uh, in terms of migration. Uh, uh, the rural, uh, you know, urban migration. Uh, it is noted that uh, you know uh, significant, uh, you know, significant transportation improvements, uh, more so uh, with regard to to road network, railway, uh, rail network. You know, you know, uh, have improved over time, and uh, this then has uh, accelerated the movement, uh, uh, enhanced the movements uh, of, of people. Who then now find it easier to move to the secondary cities, uh, and then in addition to the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, of course uh, has had its fair, uh, you know, of contributions towards uh, uh, either movement from or to uh, our secondary cities. Uh, this is uh, an issue that uh, is still with us, and uh, and how it is managed is is is, is an issue is an is an I I I. I an issue that uh, is being monitored closely, uh, not only in Kenya, but in the region and uh, the African continent. Uh, the you. issue of uh, the role of the intermediate cities in enhancing uh, balanced development. Uh, wrap up, is, wrap, yes, wrap up, Dr. Uh, I'm wrap wrapping up, up. Just, just as has been mentioned, uh, the point that uh, I mentioned earlier is that uh, the intermediate cities uh, plays a critical role. But uh, as we move to Afri cities, one of the issues that uh, we then try to look at is uh, the issue of how this balance is taken up and how the governance structures uh, is, uh, is enhanced at uh, the citywide level, which then prepares our intermediary cities to uh, take up the issues that, uh, emerging issues that they are able to contend with. Otherwise, at uh, this point, I'm looking forward uh, uh, to having discussions around these issues as uh, we move to uh, to 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 Afri cities 
And uh, just uh, the last point is the issue of climate change. Uh, where the advanced climate change effects has added, uh, you, know, you know, the pain uh, to the vulnerable rural communities leading to the climate refugees, a point which I addressed earlier, who in turn seek solace in the intermediary cities and other urban areas with the hope of meeting the needs uh, of uh, the basic need, much needed basic need. The sufficient calls for enhancement of adaptive capacity of the vulnerable urban areas and, you know, urban poor populace in the intermediary cities. And uh, this is a debate that uh, we then take forward. Uh, otherwise, thank you. Thank you very much, for, uh, Dr. Sangori, uh, for this uh, very rich discussion. That brings another perspective to the discussion so far, the role of national government. And uh, it's very important to notice in the case of Kenya how, uh, you know, the spirit of the constitution uh, is really looking into the balanced territorial or devolving functions uh, to, to lead, so that no one and no place is left behind. And he, he really mentioned the, the importance of... Um, again in the constitution uh, how uh, in terms of leaving no one behind how the youth the women the disabled are also uh, captured in this um, uh, you know all this the structure of the the governance that we have that help enhance urban and rural development in the context of um, territorial harmonious uh, development he, he also emphasized the importance of the ability of intermediary cities, the fall that we have in Kenya to to address challenges such as COVID-19. He mentioned climate change, uh, migration, uh, market, um, and so forth. So very important, um, a good example to 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 look into, to get inspired by. Um, uh, at this juncture, I would like to really apologize that we are running out of um, you know the time, but. Um, I can see the discussion is still very uh, attractive. Uh, I also want to uh, draw your attention to some of the questions that are being posted uh, in the chat from Professor Owo, uh, um, uh, Dr. Opio, uh, you know, that uh, you could respond to. Uh, but as we turn now into the how, how do we actually make some of these things work and where that had worked? So it's my uh, distinct uh, pleasure to uh, invite um, our colleague from FAO, uh, Cecilia Marocino, who is the Urban Food uh, Agenda Coordinator in the Food System and Food Safety Division um, at FAO. And we have heard a lot about food, market, agriculture. Now tell us all, what do we need to do? Cecilia, you have the floor. Thank you, Remy. Uh... I think Grace is going to share uh, the, the screen, no? or Grace or uh, Marco. Yes. yes, thanks. Thanks, Grace. Good afternoon, everyone. So really, I thank you, you and Habitat, for inviting FAO at this uh, webinar in, uh, the, in the preparation of the important Africity Summit 2022. So as Remy was mentioning, the focus of my presentation will be on, uh, on this uh, important uh, entry point, which is a food system, and the importance of mainstreaming food system in uh, local policy and planning uh, as a way to achieve the overall food system transformation and also contribute to strengthening the urban-rural linkage in, in, in the intermediary cities. Um, following what I mean, Jean Pierre Longbassi was mentioning uh, at the beginning in the session. So, food system depends a lot, a lot on the linkage between urban and rural area. And uh, here, the intermediary cities have a big role to play. Next, please. So, why food system? Just to give uh, a, a quick uh, overview on uh, on uh, on some data. So the importance of local food system becoming become evident if we look at some data. We all know that by 2050, the urban population is expected to reach 68%. And up to 70% of the food supply is consumed in area defined as urban. And of course, this is expected to grow along with urban, urban population. And it is not a, only about people and number, but is also about the, 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 the access to nutritious food, is about the food consumption pattern. 
So actually, uh, urbanization is impacting uh, the consumption pattern, which is in increasing consumption of food uh, rich in salt, in fat and sugar, and which create risk in terms of uh, non-communicable di diet-related disease in urban area, with an increasing on different forms of malnutrition, including obesity. So it's a matter of food supply, but it's also a matter of consumption part. And then, I mean, uh, next, please, uh, we have to consider that this agenda, the food system agenda, is becoming increasingly important in many cities. Let's look, I mean, uh, to all the different city network. If we look at uh, C40, they have a specific thematic network uh, on food system. And if we... Uh, there is another, there is a different uh, presentation or uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, Dr. Sangori, uh, you can send the, the, your PowerPoint by email to us. Yeah, my colleague El will uh, post again your PowerPoint. But in the yeah. meantime, continue while she's putting that up. Yeah, no, okay, so just, man just mentioning that uh, uh, I mean, in the PowerPoint, we are in the third in the third slide. Yes. Um, so many cities, many city network are including food in their agenda. So we have a thematic sub sub network in ICLE, in C40, and we have also the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact launched in 2015 as an agreement among cities committed to develop sustainable food system. And the Milan Pact count to more than 200 cities. So we have also UCLG uh, is starting prioritizing food system in their agenda. And this is, uh, we cannot avoid, therefore we cannot avoid to consider food system as a priority, considering that many cities, including intermediary cities from Africa, are increasingly prioritizing food system in their agenda. So FAO, uh, next please, what FAO is uh, uh, proposing? Also, FAO is uh, starting prioritizing the food system agenda and increasingly supporting cities in, uh, um, in mainstreaming uh, food system in policy planning and action. In 2019, FAO launched the, the, the overall urban food agenda framework for uh, leveraging uh, food system actions at subnational level. In 2020, uh, launched the Green Cities Initiative for promoting an integrated approach uh, and supporting cities in integrating urban food system and green space in their policy planning and action. And recently, in 2021, uh, FAO has launched the, the strategic framework 2022-2031, and which include uh, the, the program Achieving Sustainable Labour Food System as one of the priority program of the new strategic framework. So FAO is, is really increasingly prioritizing the work with the subnational government and also considering the importance of uh, mainstreaming food system into local policy and plan. Next, please. In all the work that FAO is proposing, um, the, uh, is always uh, um, mainstreaming. Uh, is is uh, the, the, there are a number of set of principles that are considered a priority. So the first one is the rural urban synergies. Whatever we do, the local government receives support to work beyond the city boundary and strengthening the linkage between uh, urban and rural areas. Then, I mean, we have the principle of social inclusion and equity, the resilience and sustainability. And the last one, the food system interconnection, which is, uh, uh, which is focus on the importance of a, 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 an, an integrated perspective manner considering the interlinkage not only between the different components of the food system, uh, urban agriculture, uh, urban and peri-urban agriculture, processing, food waste management, market, but also between the food system with other systems like health or, or, or transportation or other sectors that are part of the urban and the rural development. 
Next, please. And as part of the FAO framework of the urban food agenda, so FAO is implementing a number of project program aiming and, stre and strengthening the urban rural linkages and working uh, across the administrative boundaries. So we target different typology of cities, metropolitan, uh, small and intermediary cities, and in the last years, we are increasingly giving particular emphasis to small and intermediary cities, which are vital in the urban network and where most of the population, as has been said, will be in the near future. Um, so, and we need to consider that close to half of the world population will live in a settlement with fewer than 500,000 inhabitants. And while 41% uh, in a living settlement with fewer than, than 300,000 inhabitants. And, and then we have to also to consider all the urban agglomerations that are not even recorded in, in the official statistics. Therefore, it is fundamental to focus in a small and intermediary cities. And this is why, I mean, in the in the last year, FAO uh, is, ma is trying to, 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 to understand how to better support uh, local government in small and intermediary cities and the mainstreaming food system in their policy plan and action. And just to give an example on how uh, FAO is working on the ground, uh, so just, uh, just to mention a couple of projects. Uh, next, please. So we are working in uh, one city. So I'm taking one example from, uh, from, uh, from Latin America, where we are working in an intermediary city in Ecuador, in uh, Porto Viejo. And uh, uh, so, and here in, in all the cities where we work, I mean, the FAO approach is to try to understand uh, what are the gaps in terms of food system. And so we have developed tool uh, for, uh, uh, for analyzing the food system. So we have the rapid urban food system appraisal tool. We have the city region food system toolkit and uh, tools for identify what are the gaps and also to identify uh, uh, what are the, the gaps in terms of food environment and the access to nutritious food. Uh, what is the access to nutritious food in market? So tools related to food environment and to uh, the territorial market. And so the uh, and uh, the analysis should give a lot of importance of evidence. Then, uh, I mean, the, the second component of our approach is the establishment of multi-stakeholder food governance mechanism and, uh, and, and then the implementation on action that could be related to urban and peri-urban agriculture, to market and, and, and to, to food waste management, always fostering the urban-rural connection. At the center of our approach, uh, it's always uh, the, the establishment of multi-actor food governance mechanism, uh, which basically propose uh, an inclusive engagement of local authorities and other stakeholders. Um, so multi-stakeholder multi participation is basically considered as crucial for effective food system governance and also for promoting uh, food uh, uh, linkage between uh, urban and rural area. And for instance, in the case of Porto Viejo, we have established this uh, local government, local uh, food governance mechanism with representatives from rural area, from farmers associations, from uh, 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 processors and different uh, civil society organizations. And uh, I mean, has been uh, a, a, and trying to operate between uh, the city, uh, the, the city boundaries. And uh, as a way for uh, supporting uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, urban rural, uh, these urban rural linkages uh, in in um, in in uh, in, Equa in Porto Viejo, uh, yes, thanks, Grace. Um, so we are supporting. I mean, one entry point that was selected through a multi-stakeholder process was uh, uh, the uh, support in developing the support in developing a, a decentralized public food procurement procurement mechanism to distribute locally sourced food to school. So local government is therefore part 
facilitating uh, the access to diversified diet uh, for, for, for school, as well as promoting the linkage between producers and uh, consumers. And this was also the opportunity for, um, for, 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 for to support the implementation of a new regional procurement modality, which complement the national one. And so the support, the linkage between the school feeding program with, uh, with, with, uh, with the local uh, agriculture production and overcoming the existing challenges imposed by the standard centralized procurement model. So a way for promoting urban rural linkage through public procurement, which is an entry a possible entry point for promoting the systemic approach. So next, please. Um, another intermediary cities where we work is Kisumu, uh, so where the city summit will happen. In intermediate, uh, the, the cities where today, I mean, uh, Kis Kisumu city is the, is the capital cities of Kisumu country, where today live 49% of the county population. And FAO is supporting Kisumu country, uh, again, in mainstreaming food system into local policy and plan. And uh, a comprehensive food system assessment has been carried out, looking exactly to the dynamic between urban areas and rural area and between an, uh, Kisumu County and other uh, county and the neighboring counties. And the assessment is expected to give an evidence on the existing urban rural linkage in the county and in the connection between the Kisumu County with the other counties in, in Kenya. And in Kisumu also at the center, as I said before, uh, we uh, uh, supported the local government in establishing multi-stakeholder food, uh, food governance mechanism and which uh, with representative from uh, different institutions and different food system, um, uh, food system and uh, actors uh, with, with, with actors related, different actors related to food system. And this multi-stakeholder advisory group um, has the mandate to work across the urban rural food system space. So, and is promoting the engagement of actors that uh, live in, our, in our rural areas or in peri-urban areas in, in, in Kisumu country. And the number of quick win action uh, have been related to food system are in the process to be implemented related to uh, promotion of urban and peri-urban agriculture, connection between producers and the market in Kisumu county, including uh, uh, the, the, the role of women street food vendors. So uh, uh, really to create this connection through a multi-stakeholder and multi-actor process, uh, which can facilitate these, uh, uh, these are and strengthening you know, the, the, the urban rural linkage. Another, uh, so next please. Another point that I want to highlight is uh, um, that, I mean, the importance of uh, the, to do the, what, in addition to, uh, to, to action on the ground for mainstreaming food system into local policy and planning is necessary to, to make change uh, also at global and national level to ensure that cities and local government effectively contribute to, to accelerate food system transformation. And actually FAO in collaboration with UN Habitat, UCLG and many other partners, uh, during 2021, we were very active to really push the global agenda, taking advantage of the Food System Summit and trying to promote um, the role of local government in, uh, in, in food, local and regional government in food system transformation. But because we have to say that in most cases, particularly in developing countries, subnational governments are not really recognized as a key player in, in the food system uh, transformation. And so uh, we have been working on the establishment of this uh, uh, urban food system coalition um, to ensure that the voice of local and regional government is recognized in the overall food system transformation agenda. 
And uh, so I, have, I am the, uh, so I am happy to share that the Urban Food System Coalition is now formally recognized as one of the emerging coalition coming out of the, the Food System Summit process and aims at fostering dialogue among different level of government on, on food system. And that will be the way to, um, one way, possible way to, uh, to, 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 to push for this agenda, the food system agenda, as an important agenda for both urban and, and rural development. So I would like to conclude uh, just next, please. I would like to conclude with uh, just a few points. So the role of the intermediary cities as a key player for promoting food system transformation, reduce poverty and promote sustainable agriculture. And the, 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 the intermediary cities can be the hub of activities related to food system, logistic, transport, uh, uh, trading services. And as we saw, I mean, in the case of Porto Viejo, in case of Kisumu, there is food system could really help to uh, strengthening the urban rural linkage and also promoting the participatory, the participation of different stakeholders in the development of the local um, uh, the, 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 the local policy planning and, and, and action. So the second point is the importance of, uh, um, of policy action that is needed to promote multi-sectorial, multi-level and multi-actor multi coordination. And policy needs to go beyond the artificial political administrative boundaries. We need to think that even urban and rural, I mean, the dichotomy is, is becoming more and more blur, blur, uh, blurred. So we need to, 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 to really think in terms of going beyond the artificial political administrative boundaries. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, as I, 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 as I was stressing uh, when I mentioned the two examples of Puerto Viejo and Kisumu, the establishment of food governance mechanism, which are an opportunity to go beyond the administrative boundaries and also create linkage among various cities in the same territories. So, for instance, either in Kisumo or in, or in, in, or in, in, in Porto Viejo or in other intermediary cities where we are working, we are trying to create, we are supporting the municipality in creating linkage between the cities where we work and the surrounding cities in the same territory in order to operate along the rural um, uh, urban continuum. And in many cities, the food governance seems to be the key to successfully integrate food system into local planning process. Of course, the key challenge remain the food governance gap between the national and the local government, which need to be addressed. And here the role of um, a policy integration is fundamental and also the role of UN agencies in, in, in working together for promoting this policy integration is also fundamental. So just to conclude, FAO will be keen to continue this dialogue and exchange on, uh, on the importance of mainstreaming food system in local policy and plan for intermediary cities uh, during the Afri City Summit and bringing the experience of the different cities and also exchanging uh, experience, uh, I mean, with, uh, with the other cities in Africa and uh, uh, particularly on the importance of the food governance for bridging the urban-rural divide and promoting food system transformation. Over. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for this brilliant presentation where we, we got to learn a lot about, um, you know, some uh, important uh, FAO initiatives that, that are geared towards uh, the topics of interest here, that is the next step between urban rural, rural and then the, the role of intermediary cities. Uh, where we also demonstrated through some case studies why is it important to work through the lens of multi-level, multi-stakeholder, or multi-actor, a multi-sector uh, approach to make a difference. So very much appreciated, and uh, to emphasize again the, the, the importance of policy integration, both at local and uh, national, global, and the initiative also at global level. So excellent uh, input to that reflection. Now it's my honor uh, to welcome Vicente, my good friend here, who had a wealth of experience uh, working on this very important topic uh, from the economic and the data side, 
um, you know, in OCD countries, but also in uh, developing countries that recall some experiences we had in Ethiopia. So we are very, we, we are very much uh, looking forward to, to hearing your latest development and advice, uh, what you should do to advance this topic in Africa. I know we worked a lot on the platform, and this could be something we can take forward and also harness some ideas here. So uh, Vicente Reyes, um, who is an uh, economist at OECD, will share his thoughts on the OECD uh, approach to, to this important topic. Uh, Vicente, you have the floor, sir. Peter, Remy, everyone around the, thing, the table, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. As Remy said, uh, in the OECD Development Center, actually in partner with UN Habitat, we've been working uh, very closely to, 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 to try to better understand the role of intermediary cities um, in developing countries. Uh, so for the past few years, this has been a critical area of work for us. And since 2020, sorry, uh, along with UN Habitat, we started um, a new adventure, let's say. And we, were, we questioned ourselves about the importance of intermediary, intermediary cities and climate change. Um, so for the past couple of years, we've been working to try to better understand the different connections that, that are very complex, of course. And we produced a report uh, that we finished last year that will be launched in the next few months. Um, and I will try to do in a very short time to, uh, to, to give you some key messages uh, about that, that, that came out from this report. Of course, the report is more than 200 pages, so I, I cannot dwell on everything that it's critical, but I'll do my best to, to answer some critical questions. For some reasons, I cannot share my slides, so uh, um, it'd be great if Grace you could, or Eol, you could just do it for me. If you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so the first question um, we wanted to, to, to answer, that we actually were questioning ourselves was, why intermediate cities matter? Uh, why intermediate cities in developing countries matter for climate change? Uh, as has been extensively discussed today, and I'm not going to dwell too much on this, we all know that they play a very important role in the urbanization process of developing countries. But something that has come up very clear in our analysis is that these are very dynamic um, uh, agglomerations, meaning that in many cases they are growing very fast, faster than uh, faster than bigger cities, and not just in terms of population, but also they're expanding faster. Um, and but they are very heterogeneous. Um, and what I'm trying to say by heterogeneous is that um, it's very hard to come up with a simple narrative about intermediary cities because they are very different. Even within the same country, we see all sort of patterns of growth patterns. Um, and I come back to this because this, this has important uh, implications in terms of policy. Uh, I'll come back to this at the end. But when it comes to climate, climate change, along with these dynamics, some of the structural characteristics of these cities um, make them very, very, very sensitive, very vulnerable to climate change. As was discussed also earlier today, many of these cities have a, a, a weak governance capacity, um, human capacity sometimes is not necessarily low, but it sometimes uh, is, doesn't stay, uh, which makes harder to accumulate knowledge. Um, but more than this, uh, the, the, in the case of intermediate city, this, the strong connection to rural areas sometimes makes them more exposed to the shocks of climate change that are taking actually place in rural areas. Um, and what we also learn from our analysis is that it's not just they not, they're not just going to play an important role in terms of adaptation, but also in terms of mitigation efforts, they will have a very important role to play in the next decades. Um, so I'll try to go through these three points, basically. So if you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so how climate change is affecting the cities. Um, not surprisingly, it's affecting cities independently of their size. We try to separate the effects of climate change in intermediate cities by looking at direct effects and indirect effects. The direct effects are the ones that you know very well, the heat waves, water stress, drought, flooding, storms, you call it. Those shocks that affect cities independently of the site or the function. Uh, however, the indirect effects um, are particularly relevant for intermediate cities because these effects happen 
especially sometimes in rural areas, but they kind of translate to in seminary cities. The, the effects accumulate across the rural urban continuum and impact and impacts in seminary cities. Um, not surprisingly, this follows the critical challenge, the two main challenges, sorry, connecting urban and rural areas, which is uh, food, um, uh, goods, and, and people. So what we observe is that there's a disruption in food system and increasingly climate-induced migration. Um, and I'll go back to these two points in, 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 a, in a future slide. Can you move to the sec next slide, please? So I'm not going to discuss in detail all the, all, the, all the direct effects that we analyze in the report because there are, there are lots and we don't have the time. But just to tell you what, what, what I mean by, by, by this, basically um, what we wanted to do is we, we wanted to understand if climate shocks um, were affecting cities of different size in a different way. So I'm just going to show you the example of the analysis we did for flooding and storms. Um, so on the left side of the of the, the, the graphic on the left side, I'm showing you the share of the population at risk of storm um, in coastal areas, by the way, and the share of built up at risk of flooding in in, in cities close to um, to rivers. And um, basically, just with the simple graphic, uh, we can see that cities, uh, smaller size cities, have a higher share of this population at risk. This can it be explained by different reasons. Um, Okay, before I keep on going, um, I'm, we are looking at, at cities in developing countries uh, across Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Uh, again, we don't have the space to go in the chain of the regions, but of, this is the overall picture. Um, so what we observe is this gradient that shows that cities of a small size tend to be more exposed than, and, than, than larger cities. Again, this can be explained, but sometimes by having inadequate infrastructure of growth patterns that have exposed certain uh, new new dwellings in areas with high risk, etc. So on the right side, we, we question ourselves. Okay, so we, we look at this because sorry because this data for, is for 2015. But when we question ourselves ourselves about the evolution of these how these things have changed in time, um, we wanted to analyze, for instance, an increasing build up how it has affected the area exposed to flooding within cities. So on the right side, you have the results of an econometric analysis analyzing more than 10,000 cities between 1990 and 2015. And without entering too much detail into the, the numbers, the message that I want you to keep is that the, the, the dots that you observe oh, yeah. in these graphics are the impacts of increasing built up on the area, on the, flood, on the percentage of flooding area, meaning that bigger cities in bigger cities, increasing build of it has a bigger impact on the flooding area, right? Um, so this is the type of analysis we wanted to, we did in order just to question ourselves about the shocks of climate change on cities. And I'll come back to this point again on 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 on, on the shocks on cities of different size. Can we move to the next slide, please? Um, but as I mentioned before, intermediate cities because these in, these intermediary function they play, they also exposed to shocks that take place across the rural, rural urban continuum. This is a very simplistic uh, diagram that Drew may know very well, especially those that are familiar with the rural urban literature, in which we wanted just to portrait the different activities that take place across the rural urban spectrum and how climate change is affecting these activities across the space. So basically, uh, in a very, very simple way to put it, what we observe is that what happens in, in rural areas for the effects, what happens in urban areas eventually affects intermediary cities. For instance, the shocks that we observe in rural areas are mainly linked to the decrease in, in agricultural productivity, mainly uh, climate shocks and or changes basically in, in, in climatic conditions tend to reduce yields and reduce agricultural productivity. Um, but these, and this goes up through the value change, uh, but we observe, and this is something that we're starting to, to, to discover, that climate change is not just affecting rural areas in terms of productivity, but in higher parts of the, of the, of the value chain, for instance, there, there's been damage in infrastructure, which further disrupts food systems, and eventually they impact 
the, the, low, the, the decrease in productivity and the damages in infrastructure, infrastructure, for instance, can impact food security in intermediary cities. Um, and this is true only just looking at this through the food system channel, but it also, it also manifests through um, migration. Um, and this is uh, an area that we are investing more energy to better understand how climate change is affecting migration from rural to intermediary cities. And the results we have, they show that it does. It's very difficult to, 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 either to capture these effects because all the different things that promote migration between rural and urban. Uh, but overall, we do see uh, evidence that uh, climate change is affecting migration from rural to intermediary cities. Next, please. But as I mentioned before, I mean, when it comes to climate change, it's not, it doesn't matter only that the, the, um, we're not only talking about adaptation, we're also talking about mitigation. And this is an area where um, intermediary cities are kind of lagging behind. What we observe in our analysis is that um, most intermediary cities uh, are investing uh, sometimes a limited, limited budget to address issues linked to adaptation, basically because they have no choice, basically because they have to react to climate shocks. So most of the investment goes in that direction. However, when it comes to mitigation, they will play a very important role in the next decades. Why? Because what we observe is that as these cities grow, of course, as you can expect, the impact on, on CO2 emissions is going to increase. As these cities grow, just not in terms of population, but also in built up, the, 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 the contribution to CO2 is going to change. What I want to show in this graphic is something similar to what I've shown in the flooding case. Uh, we analyzed through econometric analysis cities across time, and we wanted to see how changes in terms of their population, the GDP, and built up impact uh, CO2 emissions. And the results show that there are different contributions depending on the side that you can expect. Cities with lower GDP have a lower impact on CO2. Um, the same thing with population. As population increases, the contribution to uh, CO2 increases too. This is not the case of built up, however. As cities, as cities grow, let's say, the contribution of expanding built up to CO2 is slower. Is lower. This could be to the fact that cities, bigger cities tend to have higher levels of agglomeration and even a better provision of public um, public services like public transport. So these can compensate some of the uh, some of the previous contribution to CO2. Um, but these really raise the question about um, not thinking about intermediary cities as a static uh, entities, but something that is going to be changing in time. So the message that we should take from here is that as these cities grow, the contribution to CO2 is going to increase. So um, this takes me to my last slide. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so let me conclude um, very quickly with four points. Um, the first point concerns about my first, very first message about um, the heterogeneity uh, and the strong difference we find when we look at intermediary cities. Uh, in my opinion, this cannot be undermined. Why? Because this has he really highlighted the importance of, his, of, of policies that are not space blind, meaning that policies that just focus on cities or even intermediary cities that just as, as if they were just one type of city or the median type of city, they are going to miss the mark big time because we see very different patterns even, even within countries, within a country when it comes to uh, intermediary cities. As I mentioned before, the lessons we take from this report is that even if intermediary cities do not account for a big share of the contribution to CO2, they probably will in the next times. So we have to have a, a, a dynamic approach when it comes to intermediary cities, meaning that they are not always stay the same side. They are going to change. And this is exactly what I said about the dynamics. In many cases, they are changing very fast. So the mitigation policy is a very important and pending agenda uh, that, especially in, 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 in our work, we would like to, 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 to address in the next few years. Uh, along with UN Habitat, for instance, we will put in place some case studies to try to analyze um, how we can uh, use a, a, a um, system approach to identify bottlenecks and ways in which intermediate cities can have a better uh, mitigation policies. 
And let me just conclude with um, a, probably a positive um, message that is that so far, as we've said before also, um, intermediate cities have been seen as the underdog as, and all, usually overshadowed by big cities. But what we're starting to understand is that being in small could be actually an opportunity, you know, not having such a complex, uh, complex issues as big cities, not having such a big pie of stakeholders to deal with when we want to promote reforms can actually be an important uh, asset for intermediate cities in the future. Um, so I will conclude here. Um, if you can move that to the next slide, please. Uh, just um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, I'm afraid that I'm running super late for a meeting that I had at 3 p.m. So I could not stay any longer. But if you have any question or, 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 or comment, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me. Ma many thanks uh, to, to Remy and the team. Excellent job and look forward to continue the discussion with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicente, and all the speakers and those who are still online for being so patient. Uh, I think uh, another great contribution uh, in our uh, discussion on say, the heterogeneity of uh, intermediary cities, they are not all the same, they are so different. The importance of intermediary cities, not only on adaptation, mitigation, and uh, what you said, uh, to consider the dynamics, the changing nature of intermediary cities, and finally, more importantly, um, the future is not only rural, but small, it can be beautiful and an opportunity. Thanks a lot for those uh, really important points. Uh, now it's my opportunity uh, to invite my colleague Rene Hoffman, uh, Hoffman who is uh, from Cities Alliance, uh, to share, you know, Cities Alliance had done, a, you know, a breakthrough type of research on intermediary cities, uh, though we have been uh, pondering, do we call it secondary cities, intermediary cities, human settlements, but put aside the concept, uh, what City Alliance had to maybe highlight in terms of, um, you know, some entry points that could be very relevant uh, to advance this important topic. So, Rene, you had the floor, sir. Thank you so much, Remy. And I would like to thank you for the host for inviting the Citizen Alliance Secretariat also to this webinar. Um, you note if you see my uh, the slides, um, then I can know that the technique, yeah, it is, okay. So, Remy, if the role of the webinar was to raise the appetite for more discussion on the topic at the AfroCity Summit in Kizumu, I would like to already congratulate you of having achieved it. So I'm up for it. It is uh, very uh, I'm engaged and, and I'm looking forward to that. I will short my presentation and jump here and please apologize, but I'm also in a little bit of a time constraint now. Um, I would like to start with a challenge. Um, what we see in our work in Africa is that many development partners and governments tend to perceive cities as isolated entities rather than actors within a system and networks. And I used here the, 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 the image of a flying saucer, of a floating city that was pictured in 1922, that cities that are are not embedded in the, in the, in the systems and the food systems and any kind of relationships to each other. And I think here lies a problem. It lies a problem in presenting data, collecting data. If you don't ask the questions how cities and their regions are connected, you are in a static mindset of, of uh, collecting data. And I will show you later what it leads to. But I think the most important part is that there are policy gaps among national responses to sustainable urbanization and economic development. And if we don't think about the relationships between the cities, how they relate to each other, what the flow, uh, the flow of goods, services, people, information makes out of economies, you offer or you encourage a competition between types of cities and follow old or the rather older con conceptualization of just finance growth poles and the rest will follow. I think this creates a winner takes all situation in investment decisions. That is against our, I think, common agenda to leave no vulnerable people and places behind. I'm not going into the depth of this one, um, but I, we can say that we are, since the 1990s, we look at a rich legacy of strategies and conceptualization of how cities are interlinked and also on the agenda of development partners that make them even, you know, as kind of a backbone of their engagement strategy. We also looked at different types of cities. But it, at, at its core lies a particular interest to help cities to better benefit from the flows of goods and services and people in advancement of the territories for their social and economic development. 
Um, and why do we think, I think it is now an acute time and opportunity to rethink and foster such a perspective. We've heard in the start from Jean-Pierre and Raf, and also from Uma that the climate, given the climate crisis and the current global economic restructuring in a COVID-19, I think, reality, we face an historical junction and opportunity, an opportunity to go beyond growth policies, depending on exogenous growth principles, in other words, competing cities and region to become part of that global economy and supply chain. I think a system of cities approach cannot only inform a national spatial uh, economic development plan, but also very locally determine how rural and urban linkages can be strengthened and what kind of investment can animate the flow of goods and services between them as a part of a national and regional supply chain. But now from that philosophy, and that's why I was actually invited to think what, what needs to happen. I think we need to shift in planning and policy to understand each particularity of national system. Do we have clusters of, sister, of cities that around metropolitan regions that trade, that um, encourage thinking about exactly that static mindset and data collection? It is actually not important how big your city is. It is important how many people are at the daytime and at the nighttime to see what kind of services do you provide actually for the surrounding areas, what kind of transport system we need. Thinking about corridors and here, thinking um, not only the corridors between countries, but also what role plays the cities cross borderly to, to, to inform that trade. Uh, but we have also, and that I would like to debate somewhere else, um, there are also isolated cities. One could argue that to become intermediary, you need to intermediate, you need to already have the function. And if you don't, you're isolated. And I think these, we need just to acknowledge, happens as well many times. There are also patterns, I think, uh, uh, again, to think about the flows between the cities, but also the cross-border significance. I was alluding to it um, uh, just in a minute ago for on the cross-national significance um, of those interrelationships. Now, let's come quickly to an example, and this is a very complementary to the first segment. Here, I would like to just throw in three examples that you please approach me if you need further information. Here's the first example that is currently on behalf of the government of Kazakhstan implemented by the World Bank and the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that looks at hard and soft infrastructure uh, uh, along a corridor along the coastlines. But the interesting point is here in that project that it only looks only not, not only looks at connectivity, better street networks, associated infrastructure for mobility, but also the productivity of the cities themselves. What role do, does urban, uh, urban spaces play? The, the access to water supply, a good sanitation infrastructure, because these are all linked to the productivity of a city. The second example is something that is not from by national government, but by cities themselves. Here, it's the New Zealand, New Zealand um, core cities network initiated by the cities themselves, thinking about how they can, can, can collaboratively build up a business case, increase their um, 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 collaboration and formulate some trade partnerships, in this case, with China. And last example, again, where this collaborative, I think, um, um, aspect is coming to the fore is from the Danube region. Here, again, five countries, in five uh, particular uh, five countries and five cities. So thinking about how a cross-border collaboration between the cities can inform a common vision, but also a commitment to develop joint development, uh, spatial development strategies. I really make it short, Remy, because I <laughs> you, you asked for it. So um, now I come to three tools that I would like to offer that uh, you, uh, every city, every mayor, and uh, and I think can apply. Here is first one that we develop, thinking about the underlying need for connectivity between the system of cities. It argues to apply a system-based thinking approach. It looks at investments in hard and, infra and hard and soft infrastructure that can create equitable economic growth, connecting cities with their rural and internet, but also between the cities. Huh? That's a, it also offers a kind of a connectivity index analysis. So actually, if you are interested to see how, uh, in what sense you are connected, you have at least a set of uh, question and a set of indicators then can give you um, um, an indication of it. The next two that I would like to uh, uh, approach, unfortunately, uh, it's also, uh, there are many out there, but what are the differences? I think in this one, 
Um, this looks at, uh, was built for secondary, for intermediate city or for small and medium sized cities, whatever, in data scarce environment. It doesn't require big censuses, it doesn't require GIS data, it requires a questionnaire, it, it, it requires a process at the local level to think about what kind of public services can increase the, uh, the productivity of your hybrid economy. Here again, and, and this is perhaps the difference, it, it is really looking at the formal and informal sector, how they contribute, how they, how they link to each other, and how this can services can provide both sectors to actually grow the uh, economic uh, um, um, potential of the city itself. Finally, and I think um, that's um, something that um, is already my last slide, um, many of those actions that we've just heard, you know, from different speakers, or also in, in that I was alluding to uh, in support of a system-based approach will require a very strong national vision and development plan that understands the gaps in service provision in cities, what it creates, what impact that has for the productivity and the advancement of the whole economy and the society, explores the enhanced productivity opportunity in new economic development models. Again, it is not the aim and it should not be aimed to that every city is part of the global supply chain. We are talking now about with, with the systems that we have in place in the climate change crisis about national and regional uh, economies that need to be strengthened, especially as we've seen um, um, in, the, in, the, in the current environment of COVID-19. A national development plan that acknowledges the relation between cities and rural areas and prioritize investments and actions in a more balanced and efficient manner. And for this, as you can see here, there's already a rich body of guiding principles, guidelines, review of national policies, and the institutional enabling environment for cities that offer practical benchmarks and a set of indicators against which we can assess and inform the national policy environment. Here, I'm looking forward to the launch of the fourth edition of the Cities Enabling Environment Rating of all national governments in Africa that we will launch together with UCIGA at AfriCities in Kisumu. I think as an urban community that sees the political and social and economic value of linkages between territories, I think we should and can only applaud and for, for, uh, further foster an emerging vision in policy and financial decision-making for development that integrates um, sectoral requirements at the regional level. Acknowledging the value chains and interconnectivity between cities of all sizes and their embeddedness in regional circular flows of goods, services, and people. Thank you very much for your attention, and we are looking forward to further deepening our commitment on intermediary cities and uh, uh, the commitment to the agenda. And uh, looking forward to ho hopefully see you all in person in Kizumu this year. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you so uh, Rene. Uh, for... A bit of echo. Uh, for the patience and for staying on and for sharing this very important, uh, you know, insight, which uh, we would have missed if you have not attended. Uh, I think you, when you started by uh, reminding us some of the challenges that some of these intermediary cities, though there have been a call for looking into the opportunities, but the challenges we, we don't have to, um, uh, you know, on the rate or uh, on the mind that. And also the, some of the approaches you have brought forward that uh, would be very important. The system thinking, we have to think in terms of system, the corridor approach, uh, looking at isolation, uh, so maybe of the, some of the functions, and um, hammering the importance of collaboration, partnership, and the tools that you have proposed in terms of approaches. Connectivity could be one lens that can help us understand how to foster that collaboration. We can look at, um, again, that idea of the continuum or linking, formal and informal, which is very important, and to learn on the territorial approach that my colleagues, um, Salvatore, we touch on, you have to look into the territory, but at the national level, what does that mean, the national wide type of approach? So excellent input. Uh, we are very grateful. They be very important for the preparation of our cities, and we look forward to seeing you, of course, in Kisumu in May. So uh, again, now is my opportunity to invite my colleague, uh, Salvatore Fondoro, uh, who will share some uh, instruments or tools from UN Habitat that could help foster further uh, the, the intermediary cities in the context of uh, linking urban and rural um, for a better territorial development, not only territorial balance, but territorial development. So Salvatore, you have the floor. Thanks, Remy. I will, 
I will. I know that I'm the last one, so maybe the audience will be uh, will be tired. But uh, I will try to do my best. Also, many concepts uh, will be repeated because uh, being the last one, I think. Uh, but it's it's okay. It's good because we are on the same page. It means we are on the same page. I will present uh, some slides uh, on uh, our work uh, we are doing in uh, in Conakry. Um, Hope you can see it. It's not appearing. Let me check again. Yeah. Somehow is not showing okay. the presenter. It's okay. We can see, but it's not in a presentation mode. Okay. Yes, now. Okay. Not on my screen yet. Did you share there is it? Did you there is share some it delay. Okay. Yes, I think it's a delay. Let me okay. take off the, the video. Can you see it? Not uh, on my screen yet. Yeah, now. Oh. now is now is it? Yeah, now it's good. Okay. Now it's good. Now it's okay, good. thank Very you. Good. So uh, my presentation will be uh, on the linkages between urban rural uh, linkages and uh, intermediary cities and the role of uh, regional and territorial plans that actually is something that have been already mentioned before by uh, Dr. Saini, but also by our colleague uh, Aloy Sager in, in Kisumu. So. Uh, as you can see uh, from this picture, there was a few weeks ago an uh, interesting, uh, interesting publication in the, in the Washington Post regarding projection for most populous cities in 2025. And you will see that still uh, Asian cities are the most uh, populous one. But was that was interesting that the projection, according to the studies for uh, 2100, will show how Africa will take the lead. Actually, uh, being Lagos in Nigeria, the most populous uh, city in the world with 80 uh, million inhabitants. And also the same uh, document, the same paper was showing how uh, the biggest cities in the world right now will decrease population in, in the same period. And uh, uh, that uh, compared with the, also uh, the fact that, uh, according to data from OECD, the uh, urban population in intermediate cities in Africa is still 60%, but is decreasing the percent of uh, urban population. So what is happening? Uh, in, my, in our opinion, there is uh, still in the mature, uh, let's say, urbanization world that is related to the biggest city right now in the global north, in which uh, intermediary cities Hello. are uh, a sort of uh, good support for uh, for no, uh, mega. Yeah, en fait, on <laughs> uh, sorry, I see some noise. Oui, uh, oui, 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 tout à fait. The 60% uh, actually is a, uh, is in decreasing uh, along the main population. So uh, inter the role of intermediary city in terms of population is decreasing. But uh, still, so that means that something is happening. Uh, it is true that still the population is in the, in the intermediary cities, but is decreasing. And what we, uh, and I'm starting with the uh, Conakry Regional Plan, uh, the example that I want to show is an ongoing plan that we are doing in Conakry with uh, UNHABITAT with the support of the European Union. We uh, mapped the uh, movement uh, between the country and the region toward the main city. And we see that in the one year, almost the capital city of Konaki uh, uh, had an increase of population of 150,000 uh, person. And the intermediary cities related to the metropolitan area also had an increase of population. 
That, as you know, and has been explained in, by, by many of the panelists uh, before me, uh, is in creating problems of densities, of uh, unbalance of uh, uh, service provision, and also uh, a disruptive uh, continuum between the urban and rural environment. So uh, when we arrived, uh, luckily there was already a vision approved by the government that was uh, polycentric, uh, tending to uh, polycentric regions in which we had to balance the role of intermediary cities surrounding Conakry, the capital city, through uh, different uh, infrastructure and uh, policies. We uh, saw that the, the, the Conakry plan will improve and uh, implement this uh, 2040 vision uh, using it as a sort of already uh, approved uh, document. As you can see, the, among the seven pillars of the, of the vision, the one is the balance between cities in the preserved environment. So the relation between cities, the balance of cities, but not only this, also the environment protection. As you can see, Conakry is on the coast and there is a lot of mangrove area on the coast that is actually endangered by this pressure and this migration from inland to uh, the capital city. Of course, the methodology adopted by the team is uh, to analyze different things like the soil coverage, the protected areas, the risk, the flooding areas, the urban growth, the economy, the transport, the water supply and the waste management, uh, typical uh, analysis that we are doing uh, while uh, planning. And of course, uh, arriving with uh, some uh, key challenges and possible solutions. Uh, from that, we started also to build three scenarios. Uh, one is the business as usual. What will happen if we don't, uh, let's say, uh, do nothing? We leave things are as they are. Uh, a second scenario with uh, following the 2040 vision um, and, and, and sticking to that. And then uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, ambitious scenario of the compact city region with also additional elements uh, added to the Vision 2040. For doing that, we uh, analyzed, and this is the methodology we have used, we analyzed uh, both uh, projects uh, from different, um, uh, that are in the pipeline of the government at different levels, ministries, but also uh, governmental agencies, et cetera, et cetera. And we, uh, let's say, link with the different scenarios, uh, understanding that there are, uh, let's say uh, the green one are the more ambitious projects that probably are in a more soft uh, pipeline. We uh, gather all this information, not only about projects, but also about policies, and we uh, classified and uh, against the, these three possible scenarios and quantified in terms of uh, capex and, uh, of course, uh, sector. Of course, the uh, compact city region vision will uh, require more, uh, more uh, in investment, of course. And we also mapped it in a set of maps uh, for the entire region in order to explain and understand the relation between all these projects, all these investments uh, in terms of um, spatial art investment that was uh, mentioned before but also in terms of policies. Uh, we understood that the regional plan uh, have to um, guide with a menu of investments the government in order to uh, invest uh, more efficiently and according to a vision, but also only the investment are not in, uh, enough in order to uh, modify the situation on the ground. It was also before mentioned that we need policies. So we also mapped the policies that uh, uh, are required in order to uh, change the situation on the ground. This is, by the way, is a map of the uh, sector of uh, public transport in, in Conakry. So the projects that are in the pipeline from the government uh, related to uh, public transport. Apart from that, we also analyzed the gaps, the existing gaps in terms of uh, um, of uh, facilities and social services and, uh, for example, education, uh, health and uh, social facilities in, in the entire region in order to understand where the gaps are and where we have to act. 
So combining the pipelines project and where the gaps are, we uh, analyze where we have to invest. This is more or less the uh, methodology that we have. Uh, we are using. We are still in the process of prioritization. So uh, by May, probably by Afri for Afri cities, we will have a clearer understanding of where. Uh, invest where these investments uh, will go. For the moment, we have already a sort of uh, understanding of uh, the different uh, um, uh, weight of investment we will have in the three different scenarios. Of course, the, the, the green one is the more ambitious one, will require more money. But also, uh, and this is also where we are in the, in the methodology. So we will have, us, uh, at the moment, we have let's say this all menu of uh, investments mapped, uh, mapped also spatially in order to understand the, uh, the relation between uh, different investments. What we'll now do is a, a prioritization of this uh, multi criteria with a multi criteria analysis, uh, where to prioritize these investments in order to have uh, scenarios for the government in order to invest uh, according to the vision uh, selected. Um, some conclusion, uh, regional territorial plans, as I hope has been shown this uh, intervention, is are a key tool in order to address main challenges in African cities. For example, mega cities population and urban sprawl contention. In the case of Conakry, it will be really key uh, to invest in the in the intermediary cities in order to solve key problems that the city is uh, facing right now, as for example the extreme density of the peninsula and the problem with waste management that cannot be solved only acting on the city. We have uh, to contain the uh, demographic increase of the and, and, and create this sort of polycentric uh, regional city that was also mentioned by Omar in the beginning. Uh, are a key element also to implement national vision and strategies. More than uh, regional plans and territorial plans, more than urban plans are uh, the direct link to implement these visions. And uh, in the case of the urban-rural continuum, are really uh, uh, relevant. Also, of course, if we talk about urban-rural continuum, is our have a key role in order to uh, solve the gaps in services and facilities, and also, of course, uh, understanding this uh, um, food system production, uh, intermediary cities with this link between rural and urban, uh, between the mega city and the rural uh, uh, rural areas are key uh, in the uh, food system production. And unfortunately, these uh, regional plans are usually sometimes is not the case of Kenya, in which uh, we uh, know that there are the country uh, county integrated plans and the county special plans. But in other countries, in African countries, uh, still territorial regional plans are a sort of a missing element. I believe that we have to also push on on that. Thank you. Over to you, Remy. Sorry, I lost my. Yeah, I hope you can. You can hear me now. Yes, sorry. No, uh, this is. Um, thanks a lot, Salvatore, for taking this uh, example from um, Guinea, uh, Conakry, from Conakry, in fact, uh, to demonstrate really to the detail how uh, a territorial regional plan uh, can actually help um, fostering that urban rural linkages and link the greater Conakry to the, the, the satellite city um, or satellite towns around that, which are, could be considered as um, intermediate, and how the territorial plan uh, for the greater Conakry, uh, greater Guinea, that I think uh, we are also involved in, will also contribute in that. But zooming into the uh, Conakry from the the bigger city was a very interesting perspective just to say that there are different instruments that you have also used in that and i love the idea of uh, you know the costing uh, what the would that cost uh, sometimes we forget about that but uh, that's very important that uh, uh, you had uh, brought that to to our attention so now it's um it's my pleasure to um you know 
to thank you all for staying on for, for this long. I believe that uh, you you deserve a prize for you know the longest maybe uh, webinar you had attended three hours uh, the double the time that was uh, uh, initially scheduled. But it's a testimony in my view of the interest of the topic. Uh, I, I could not stop some of the speakers, and I felt they they were very rich, and I like and appreciate those who have contributed through the chat, uh, a side chat or uh, either way. But um, really appreciate you stayed on, you contributed. Uh, but we are still here. Um, up to the office cities, if you feel that you have some ideas, we pick some from the chat, from the presentations, a good harvest. So it's now my great pleasure to invite my director, uh, Mr. Uma Sila, to, to, we call it vote of thanks uh, in some of these events, uh, to celebrate, <laughs> as you were saying. So Papa Uma, up to you to, to bring this session Thank to you. a close. Thank uh, you sorry, very much. sorry, Papa Uma, just uh, appreciate mm -hmm. all the colleagues who have contributed eh, uh, to this definitely, session. Definitely. Okay, over to you, Papa Uma. Thank you very much, Papa Remy. I mean, even myself, I haven't sit, you know, in front of my desk uh, listening to people for more than years for the such a three hours time. So today I just stuck in my seat because the discussion was so interesting and we are learning a lot, as you mentioned it, uh, Papa Remy. And uh, I do not have intention really to, to summarize what has been discussed because this can be even put in a book. But just, you know, from thinking from now to Africities, how we want to engage and how we want to continue really this uh, process of discussion, exchanging, but also of learning from each other to advance this agenda of this urban rural linkages. Uh, of course, we hear a lot of thought, uh, I mean, from this uh, conversation, uh, starting from the process uh, of urbanization in Africa now, which call upon, you know, an integrated approach in terms of territorial, but also in terms of value chain and market uh, to make sure we are connecting, you know, cities and rural and urban area in terms of complementarity and not on silo. And I like, you know, this approach that Zampia has put on the table to say, don't talk about cities, neither rural. But let's talk about, you know, human settlement. And I think from the presentation from uh, Rene Ottman from City Alliance as well, we see this uh, need for integrated approach and linking different sectors and different regions to make sure at least we are addressing the need for communities, you know, in terms of development, in terms of access to, to revenue, in terms of access to opportunity. But something which is very interesting, Remy, on, on this conversation is uh, how this concept of intermediate cities erupt, you know, to be, if you want, the buffer between you know rural and area i think what's emerging from this uh, conversation and what's come to this concept of secondary cities i think the old aspect of definition because even myself listening to people i've been asking myself we talk about secondary cities because of the size or because of the position because they are between big cities or between you know one to another cities that the reason we call them and this which is the point raised by hassan on the definition on, on, on you know of, of this terminology of secondary cities and look into the concept because it's more than that yes the position i think it's about the functions of the secondary cities we're playing and i think when it's come to functions i like the point we raise as you know service providers you know even peace and stability you know climate change resilience you know filter for migration from big cities you know from small cities to another one but at the same time, most importantly, from you know the representative from East Africa local government, the interregional uh, collaboration and integration, because secondary cities finally can be even, you know, playing this role of integration and connecting region by region. But I think the whole question now, if we are all convinced about the functions, is what really do we need to make the secondary cities as powerful as we want and as an opportunity as mentioned by someone. And I think so the last presentation of Salvatore when it's come to the planning is one of the elements. And we can hear this element of planning from Raftut when we talk about integrated and co co you know, integrated planning, but also coherence of, of policies, you know, which is very important, but also looking into the fiscal system, uh, infrastructure building and others. I think there's a lot that need to be bring as a package to make sure you know those secondary cities are viable and constitute you know the hub of economic development and social transformation even environmental protection we want to give you know to those secondary cities and this all has some thinking on on the conceptual side but of course in terms of of process now I, I think we are now from now to Africa cities I think four months we cannot talk about five months even so I think some element I see necessary to follow 
as mentioned by some people, is the policy dialogue, really engaging with the policy dialogue. And thanks, Remy, for your, you know, to your to your divisions, the role they have been playing and triggering the conversation, but also the stakeholder engagement as well. And when it comes to stakeholder engagement, about well, looking different actors, and we shouldn't forget as well the private sectors, university, because Hassan has talked about the importance of knowledge as well on transforming the secondary system and education. And I think this is some need for Africa, looking into the element of education, the capacity, and make sure we have the right people in those secondary cities to take the job, but also to inspire, you know, governance element. But another element as well, which is very interesting, evidence building. I think we hear from different, you know, different uh, intervention from uh, Nigeria, from uh, from uh, 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 colleague. Uh, as a country who mentioned other things going on and how you can build those evidence and put it on the table to inform policy, but also to inform the debate. And lastly, the regional dimension. I think that's where City Alliance was insisting in terms of cooperation, partnership, because I think we need to get along, to get together to make sure at least we are, you know, uh, forming a stick, a bunch of stick and not an individual, you know, work on it and to be able to influence this uh, this process and this agenda. Of course, in the perspective of the regional of for Africa, of UN Habitat, we are already integrating, you know, this aspect of secondary city in all our thinking, in our strategy, uh, to make sure we are listening the burden we are putting on big cities and create new opportunity for uh, livability, but also for people to enjoy, you know, quality of life. So those are some elements that I can, uh, you know, just highlight from this conversation. Again, before I finish this uh, conversation, Remy, allow me to thank you and your team, Grace. You have been hardly working, you know, uh, on this process, on putting together the concept, not on really gathering people, you know, during this afternoon, but also I would like to thank the colleague from uh, UCLG Africa, Rahmatou, you know, Francois and Jean-Pierre Olombasi for the engagement, but also for their very innovative thinking on bringing, you know, this aspect of secondary cities, you know, on the table. And also I would like to thank really, you know, the, the city of Kisumu or the, you know, the county of Kisumu, Jean uh, Alois has been playing really a catalytic role on pushing this process and thanks for your support on the, and to the governor. And lastly, I would like to thank my team, Jeremiah and others who have been working behind the scene uh, to support this process of Africity and especially on this uh, you know, particular webinar. Again, thank you very much, Remy, for your great moderation. We look forward to taking it to the next step and thank to all participants who has been very patient and very uh, attentive, putting attention on this presentation. I think, uh, I hope, uh, you know, of course, uh, Grace will be sharing all presentation and all material that people present during this meeting so that we can take it as a reference point to, uh, you know, engage into further conversation when we are looking into Africities. Again, thank you very much, Remy, and thank you to everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Abdul. Thank, yes. Thank, Thank you, Remy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Omar. Good day. Thank you, Remy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure, as always. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, see, see you. Bye.